Hey, Tommy. Hey, David. David, you there? Yeah, I'm just working on my audio. Thank you. And okay. How's it going? Good morning. All right. Morning, Eric. Good morning. And hey, Vlad. Oh, Vlad's gone. <laughs> Scared him away. Hey, Clemens. Hello. <sighs> Welcome back, Vlad. Glad you're there. How about uh, Ho, are you there? Yeah, hey, Doug. Hey, hello. Hey, Doug, hello. this is Vlad. Sorry, hey. I'm fighting my laptop. <laughs> That's OK. Glad you can join us again. We missed you there for a while. I ended my sabbatical. Yeah. That's and nice. Really getting back up to speed. Cool. Hi, hey, Doug, good morning. Hey, Lou, how's it going? Let's give people just a couple of minutes. Eric, can you refresh my memory? You were pushing back on something being required for this for the manager. Was it Source or type or both? I don't particularly remember. I, I think it was probably uh, source um, type. Uh, I, I think it was into this. similar things, but I, I don't have a terribly strong opinion. No, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure I was remembering which one it was. Okay, well, we'll, we'll get back to there. All right, somebody went flying by. Oh, somebody just left. Hold on, let me ping people. All right, it's three after. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, be before we do that, though, um, we've been kind of just walking through this sample scenario with GitHub. And I want people to understand that this is just one that I threw together. If you guys have other samples or walk through exercises that you want to walk through, you know, please speak up or feel free to add it to the doc or create your own doc or something. Um, I don't want this to be all about the thing I find interesting, right? I want um, there are obviously plenty of other scenarios out there, so we need more to, to walk through to make sure we're covering all the cases. Okay, um, let's, let's quickly though recap where I think we left off after last week's call. Um, and, and please speak up if you think I get this wrong or got this wrong. Um, we decided that we're gonna add a source property and it's gonna be a single value and it's gonna match whatever the source, the, the cloud event source value is gonna be. So it's kind of like a filter in a sense, in, in the sense that um, all cloud events must have that source value. 
it's going to be required for managers to support, optional for clients to send it in on their subscribe request, and whether it, this, this required for managers or not is, we're going to start with it being required and see how it goes going forward. I know there's some questions about uh, whether it should be optional or not for managers to support it. Um, if it's absent on the, on the request, then this and the, um, the source value and the cloud events that are sent are unconstrained, meaning you can get many different values as opposed to just one value. Does that sound right so far to what we agreed to last week? Okay. Similarly, oh. We're, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, it's good. Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, similarly, we're going to add a types uh, attribute. It's going to be an array of CE type values meant to indicate the type of the events you're interested in. So again, it's kind of like a filter thing, but it's no wildcards or anything. It's just the exact values itself. Going to be required for managers to support, optional for clients to send. If it's specified, all cloud events sent must have one of those types. If it's absent, then the type value in the CEs that are sent are unconstrained. And they can be anything, barring any filter mechanisms that are specified. That's right. Okay. Any questions about that? All right, moving forward. Uh, going to keep the filters pretty much as we are, as we have them today, other than they're going to be optional for managers to support. They've always been optional for clients to send, but we're going to make it optional for them for managers to support. And then the mechanism by which they indicate that is still TBD. This in, in, the, in the discovery spec. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Um, okay, so I've based, I added this just yesterday, just to make it clear, um, or just to, because I felt like we needed some extra text in the spec and maybe this belongs better in the primer. We can figure out the exact placement of it. Um, but we did actually recently add a PR that talks about this three-step processing model. And I think we may, to, we may need to revisit that, not because it's wrong, but just to make it, make sure it's still aligned with what we agreed to up here, because we didn't have source and type before. So we may need to talk about in, in the context of creating the event. Okay, so just make, verify that text. Um, we need to make it clear that the source and type are meant to be used in the first phase, <clears throat> excuse me, meaning during the create event phase. Um, in, in particular, to help identify and configure the event source or the producer with respect to the events it's generating. Okay, now obviously the config field will, go, will play a role in that too. Okay, but, it, but we wanna make sure that when it comes to these two properties, they're meant to be used in conjunction with config to configure or identify the source or producer. Um, filter is strictly for obviously the second phase since it's the filter phase. And then sync and protocol are meant to be for the third phase. And the reason I thought this was important was because we have a quite a fair number of uh, attributes. Let me show an example, just so you guys can see what we're talking about here, right? So we have quite a few attributes here and I wanted to, a reader of this to be able to specifically say, okay, you know, this set is meant for phase one, this other set phase two, and this other set phase three. That's where there's a very clear grouping of these uh, attributes. And I think that will help people understand how we envision these things actually being used. If they're just sort of randomly scattered, it, it seems like less, less clear to me anyway. Um, but then at See, the end of it, I'm sorry, go ahead, Clint. Aren't the use of those uh, contingent on the implementation of the backing systems to which uh, subscriptions are being made? You are an excellent straight man, Eric. Yes. That's why I put this paragraph right here, because I want, it need, we need to make it clear that these are our, our design, this is our design mental model we had as we wrote the spec. However, how people choose to implement it is completely up to them as long as it gives the right semantics. So for example, you know, you could technically do the filter during the create phase if that's the way you chose to implement it, right? But, uh, and so we're not constraining that. It's just, I wanted people to understand this is, the, this is how we define the attributes. Um, in terms of how the end user kind of perceives them. And it, 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 is, it is a little bit of guidance in terms of how we kind of think the implementation might go, but we are in no way requiring that the implementation exactly match that. It just have to, it, it has to kind of appear that way to the end user in a sense. Does that make any sense, Eric? And does that cover what you're worried about? Uh, it, it makes no, sense. It's okay. As Say a no. way to, <laughs> I, think, I think there's a problem there, but. Uh, 
No, well, go ahead. Keep keep, keep going. I, I obviously missed it. Uh, no, I, I just, I mean, it's what I said already that based off of uh, the system that's being subscribed to in this particular implementation of that system, uh, there's there are attributes that could be um, part of one phase, whereas in a different system, they'll be part of a different phase. So, um, and that's not very specific, but uh, imagine, I don't know, two scenarios in, uh, you've got two Kafka topics that you're subscribing to. And so uh, in, in one of the Kafka topics, uh, the, the uh, events that flow through that topic are very specific. And so you don't need to do any filtering and just identifying that source and, <clears throat> and the, uh, uh, events in it that you're interested in, that's that's a static uh, declaration of, of, you know, where things are going to come from. But uh, in the a pure topic, the, those events are sent, and then also the events um, that uh, uh, some other kind of events are sent. So there's both the static element of hooking up and then the, uh, the specific element of filtering for just the event type that you're interested in. Right? So that's a case where, you know, same technology, everything else, it's it's user configuration specific, whether you know, that uh, the what kind of type is going to be a, um, a uh, dynamic thing or, or a static thing. And so, I don't know, it, it seems like there's so much, uh, I mean, it, it's not bad. It doesn't seem like it's a bad idea to talk about the different classes of uh, of uh, the the phases of application, the the kind of static ability to analyze something. But it seems like all all subscription APIs are going to have to pay attention to what is the meaning of this, and uh, in the particular context where it's being applied. And, and do some analysis. Even even the same argument could have both static and um, and dynamic parts, in my opinion. Can you elaborate on what you think needs to be changed in here to satisfy your concern? That's a good question. I I wasn't trying to propose anything. It's far too early in the morning for me. Um, <laughs> I honestly rolled out the minutes ago, but um, anyway, the um, I, I the this proposal of uh, stages. I I think that it's useful to talk about that being an important part of what the systems have to do. I I don't know that um, declaring what attributes are a fit into what uh, stages is something that you can do with. With reasonable confidence. Oh, okay, okay. The, the way you phrase that there clicked a little bit better with me. So thank you. So, so let me ask you. Let me let me pick on that a little. Um, <clears throat> you're because I think you're basically kind of implying that something like trying to say source only applies or typically only applies to the first phase might not be accurate. Um, and I'm wondering understand is that because you think well applying the source property may actually be implemented more as a filter kind of a thing? Or do you think trying to explain our rationale behind why source is pulled out from the filter is a bad thing? I'm trying to, I'm just trying to figure out where to, where to go with this. Cause I think, I think you're raising an interesting point and I don't want to miss it. That's why I'm trying to be sure I fully understand it. Okay, I'll do my best at this. Uh, so the, the source, um, is is could be itself a mix of dynamic and static pieces, right? So the source could be, you know, some you know kind of uh, uh, a whole string of things. It kind of says, here's the actual physical component this data is going to come off of. But then it could also include maybe the um, uh, particular topic in it, and that seems like a reasonable place. Right, but that that topic could be something in, based on the implementation that's dynamic, and um, that that maybe there's multiple topics, or maybe it's a, a you know a client to a specific kind of uh, I don't know product or something. Uh, 
retails poisoned my brain, but um, so, you know, it, there's, I want, I want uh, all the events to say, coming from, you know, the Gucci uh, stream. Um, and so that, that source could be both the stream that contains this whole slew of, of transactions and events related to products for our company. And then uh, the Gucci part of that would be a filter over uh, that stream. And, and so that's, I, I don't know. I'm, this is, I'm really kind of, stra I feel like I'm stretching in this particular case, but um, it, it seems like the sort of thing. Okay. Well, tell you what, why don't we do this? Sorry, go ahead. So we have a, so Klaus and I, we're currently working uh, in a parallel product integration stream together and uh, we want to bring some of that context here. Um, and we actually have a scenario like this where, um, or, or might have a scenario like this, we, we're in no means, by no means settled on this, but effectively um, there is an SAP system that wants to go and deliver something into Azure and to do this, we need to do a, effectively a bulk subscription um, um, on um, the, the, the customer's SAP scope. And that's something like this where, um, yeah, there's a, so it's not every, well, and let's say Gucci is, a, is an SAP customer, which is not unlikely. <laughs> um, so, so you you basically go, you have a subscription manager which now which is now acting somewhere over in the SAP system, and you say everything that's being raised in on behalf of that customer send that here. That's a that's a legit that's a legit case I think, and the way how we would prefer to model this at this point, um, certainly the Microsoft side of this of the discussion is to say, the Gucci's scope inside of that SAP system, that is a effectively the root source, if you will, is the prefix for all the other um, uh, substructure that, that might exist in that system. And if I walk up to that source, I can go and subscribe to everything that's inside of it. But that would still that would still say, so I would I would indicate in in, in this relationship I would go and indicate as the source, the super, the super scope, this like, you know, everything that exists, everything that exists, all the services that exist for Gucci in, in SAP. Um, and then I would not care about this type, but that would be my top level selector of how I get at all those events. And then at the, at the second stage, then I would go and, and potentially filter those down. But for this particular case, I might not. But then if, I subscribe into a effect. So all of that get now flows from this SAP system into um, a, a, a event dispatch broker effectively. And there you would subscribe on that same stream, which you subscribed from, from the other system. And there you would now say, um, I only want to have events from this more specific source, which is prefixed by the, the original source. And maybe only this this type and this type, and then I might also want to go and filter that further down to this subject prefix or subject suff suffix. So there's a kind of this broader subscription, which then funnels events into an event broker, where you can then go and um, and have a second level subscription to be more fine grained. That's that's one example of of where source becomes effectively a scoping mechanism. Does that make sense, Eric? I, I think so. <laughs> okay. Well, what I, what I was going to say before was I, I think rather than trying to rat hole too much on this, because this isn't really normative text in the spec, it's more like uh, insight into our thinking process or how we expected things to be done, but it's technically non normative. Eric, why don't we wait until we actually have a PR trying to address this particular task or item, and then we can wordsmith that to address your needs? Does that sound okay? It sounds great. Okay. Okay. Cool. So I think this is where we let, let this is where we landed after last week's call. Does that sound about right to people? Okay. Mm -hmm. So then what I did is I went back and revamped the the sample subscribe message based upon what we agreed to. Um, 
It still has the sync, still has the protocol. Protocol settings includes the secret, so it can do signing. This is where it really starts to change. So based upon what we agreed to, the source now becomes github.com slash cloud events slash spec. And we have two types because there were two different events that I was interested in when I want to do the subscribe. And I'll talk about that in a second. But I have no filters and no config because all the config are now encoded within the source. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, this when it got this is where it got a little bit interesting. So, when I subscribe using the normal web, uh, browser-based model for GitHub, I can give it a issues and a push type of event. Okay. Now, push is fine mm -hmm. because that that's the that's a exact one-to-one -one mapping. However, the issues is interesting because GitHub through the web interface just has the notion of issues and you get all different types of issues, right? Create versus delete, edit, that kind of stuff. However, in our adapter, we actually made the type to be github.com.github.issue.action, or maybe it's issues, I can't remember for sure. But anyway, the, the key is it's dot .action. Now, the question I had for the group here is, is our adapter wrong? Should we have not added the dot .action? Or is, does this now become an invalid, or not invalid, does this now become a, um, can we no longer use type to do this? And we have to do some sort of filtering thing if we actually do want to support, I mean, if the adapter is right, because we have no way to do prefix matching in types. No, no we can't, and we shouldn't. Okay. So the question I have is, if, if we don't want to do prefix matching here or any kind of wild carding, then is the adapter wrong? Is the adapter wrong? Well, the adapter is, I think the adapter has all liberties that it wants because it's an adapter. Like if 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 there is a com GitHub, what, what are you referring to with com GitHub issues where you say, um, because they, is, are those events that they raise? So when GitHub raises an, raises an event about an issue being created or deleted, the okay. event type is called issues or issue, one of the two, okay? okay? The actual action itself is another field inside of the event itself. Um, okay, and, what we, and what we did in the adapter is we said, well, that's interesting, but let's combine those two fields into one so that you can filter on the actual action on the issue as opposed to just, it's a generic issue event. That's why I'm wondering whether the, whether the adapter is wrong and it never should have added the word action. Uh, I, I, I think the adapter is right. Okay. If it's, if the adapter is correct, then how would we recommend people model this part of the subscribe request? Uh, they don't like, so, so, I mean, adapter means, means we take something that someone, someone built without thinking much about, um, uh, um, how we are thinking about events here. And, and we're trying to adapt it. And, and I think we want to have discrete events for each action that might happen. Okay. I think from, so, so, so how, if cloud events exist and you would design this fresh, how would this look? I mean, that's what the adapter should do. Okay. And I don't think it needs to, it needs to say, here is an existing webhook API. And how do you reconcile that with, with, uh, um, uh, with cloud events? Uh, and preserving it effectively. I mean, we could do that. And then the answer is, yeah, the adapter is, uh, is, is wrong because the adapter should do exactly what the webhook does. But if we want to go and make it useful in the cloud event sense, then we should say, okay, adapter is adapter. And it's actually, it is reinterpreting some of the things that the webhook does now. Okay, so you're saying it's okay that a native GitHub the, the native GitHub support for subscriptions, it's okay that it's going to have types that are different than what the adapter has, is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, if we were, if we were, because they're not, they're not, they're not uh, cloud events compliant at this point. Right. And when they are, I think the advice we would give them is if they ask you or if they ask me, then we would say, yeah, it would be great if you forward the issues for every particular different action um, or, or no, change type um, you have, um, you would go and raise a different event. Okay. 
I mean, this should, the adapter, I think, should reflect the guidance that we were, we would be giving one of those webhook authors for how to use, how to, how to um, raise their events. And issue seems mighty, mighty big of a scope. Okay. Uh, John, your hands up. Good morning. Yeah, I, I, and I more or less echo the same thing, right? If you, if you look at it sort of a, from a, a Rastafarian kind of perspective, they could still offer com GitHub issues that you have written as a fire hose, as well as the more fine grained types or whatever yeah, types that you're calling it. Right, so it doesn't it, it doesn't have to be a black and white, right? Relative to our spec. Okay. Okay, uh, Remy, your hands up. Yeah, and sorry, I had to drop last week. But uh, so, if I understand correctly, if I want in that case all the issues, like uh, as it cannot uh, prefix. I mean, I should not put any types and then I should use the filter because that's my only way to filter on types uh, con .github issues if I want only issues, uh, events, whatever they are, creation, deletion, or updates. Okay. Is it correct? Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I think if, yeah, I think if we keep this as is and people really, really only want the created actions, then yes, I think they have to use filters. Uh, because no, for what? Uh, so that's because what you define is normally if it's a creation, then I will see come the GitHub dot issues dot created or dot create as a type because you said it's concatenation of uh, actions and. Uh, well, on... so so I agree with you. If we were rewriting GitHub from scratch, I agree we would probably put created here, right? But this sample is trying to minimize the amount of changes in GitHub itself, meaning what do they do today? <clears throat> and natively, only today, they only support issues. They don't support a finer grained filtering through their webhook mechanism. Okay, so, so then your second uh, example, the com.github.push should be just a com.github.repository, if I'm correct, because I think the event uh, push is on the repository type, no? No, I think there is a push event. I'm pretty sure. Push event? Okay. I'm pretty sure. No, yeah. uh, I'll, look if not, I'll, I'll, double, I'll, I'll double check. Because okay. I came up with this by looking at their, at their document. But if I'm wrong, I'll let you know. But uh, yeah, you're right. It, if push isn't there and it's one level higher, then yes, this needs to be a repo or something like that. Yes. Okay. 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 So does anybody disagree with that analysis? Okay. In that case, I can buy into that. Um, okay, cool. Thank you, Clements and all for chiming in. In that case, is there anything about this subscribe then that doesn't match other people, you know, everybody's mental model of how a subscribe would look to today's GitHub? Does it seem okay, for example, to ask people to be able to construct from their, from their org and repo the source URL? That's, you know, questions like that, I think, are things we need to make sure we're comfortable with. Now, hopefully this, the discovery spec in our source template will say, you know, this part and then this uh, as a static string and then this part will be templatized. So hopefully they should be able to construct it with what's in discovery spec. Uh, so I'm probably the lazy one, but uh, if I had to post a subscription on GitHub, in my opinion, I will not put the source because I don't care what source they, for me, the source sure. is non-relevant because I'm already talking to GitHub. Well, keep in mind, the GitHub webhook API today requires you to specify what repo you want to subscribe to. Ah, so, okay, so that box is a repo, the cloud event slash pay. Yes. Okay, sorry, my bad. I thought it was just like, uh, I want cloud event spec. <laughs> 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 no, no, no. This is the Oregon repo that okay. in the previous in the previous incantation of this, these were under the config under org and, and repo. Okay. And I moved them into here. Okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns about this? Otherwise, we're going to keep moving forward. Okay. Um, so I th I thought it would be interesting to see what would happen if somebody decided not to use types 
and so they left it blank. And instead, they tried to use filters to um, to get the events that they were interested in. And I think the requests, and I say requests because there's two of them, would look like this, right? I think you'd still have the source pointing to cloud event spec in both cases. The only difference here is you'd have a filter that says simple, and we're looking for a type matching a value of issue. Actually, and technically, I guess this should mm -hmm. actually be com github dot issue. So, okay. so I have okay. a question there because I can't quite remember. Mm -hmm. um, because our YAML and the um, excuse me for that word, um, uh, <laughs> our white space sensitive specification, and um, and our, our our written spec actually diverge on that point on how the filters are being set. So we have for dialect, we I think we landed on basic instead of simple because we decided that it's not simple. <laughs> okay. I can't. Um, I forgot that. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. So so that is so that is still in the so that's that's in the doc as basic, but simple is in the in the spec. But the spec differs because we have dialect, and then we have. Um, I, I literally coded this up today, so that's why I have it very present in my head. Um, we have filter con. We have Here's filter the spec. Dialect, and then we have conditions. Yeah, so yeah. This is this is this is not this is not what we have in the in 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 the formal spec in the in the YAML. Well, it's interesting to say formal spec meaning YAML. I, I think a formal spec as the text. Yeah. Okay. Um, well. Okay. So, so <laughs> in, in the YAML, in the YAML, for whatever reason, because I because there was some edit. When you that, say that YAML, which YAML, YAML are you? Which YAML are you referring there's, to? There's in in the same repo. There is a the in parallel. There is a is a is a YAML specification that corresponds with this as Open API. Oh, okay. I mean, okay. Yeah, that's probably out of date. I think I think the spec is the more up to date thing. Let me get back to the filters here. I think I think this is what we've agreed to, mainly because um, people wanted to be able to do ands across different dialects if you support more than one dialect. Ah, uh, yeah, because then the question is whether. Do are we then okay with because we had I think before we had filter and conditions. So we had filter.dialect and filter.conditions, and then the conditions were uh, not further specified. Yeah, I think it was and an and across the it was it was ending the conditions, right? Uh okay, yeah, no, okay, no, I remember. Yes, it was ending the conditions. And um Okay, so then that's out of date. Yes, yeah, so, because I'm wondering how for any other dialect, whether the three properties type and property and value will still be okay for that. I thought we had, I think that these properties are dependent on the dialect and so they'll change. I thought. Ah, okay, that's what that says. Yeah, okay, so type property and value, okay. All right, okay. So I, because I was, I, was, I was working off the, the, the co-generated um, co types from that open API spec and I was just puzzled, puzzled by the discrepancies, um, but now I remember. Okay, thank you for, for helping, uh, helping me through this. Okay, sure. Okay, so going back to here, um, I think in order to get the same semantics, because it's an and in the filters, you have to do two different subscriptions, one asking for a type of issue, and then another asking for a type of push. But basically everything else is the exact same. Okay. Um, that's, that's the way it would have to be today based between our spec and the way GitHub works. Yes. Um, okay. And notice that, you know, this is asking for the generic issue thing. We could, just like above, if we needed to filter on just create, then we, can, mm -hmm. then we have to add a filter mechanism. Okay. Um, of course, the downside. That, 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 is, that is specifically why we have, have this list of types, 
to uh, because that that makes it easier to 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 subscribe to the listed types. Yep. Um, yes. Yes. It basically gives you the or. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. So the question I had for the group is. <laughs> maybe ask this later on, but I'm gonna ask it now anyway, is this okay, right? Because in this, in this simple case, it's easy to say, well, dummy, you should have used the type field. That's what the, you know, that's, it gives you the or semantics. But, you know, what if I wanted to use prefix here instead and allow a little bit of wildcarding? That pushes me towards two different subscribes. So my question for the group is, should filters allow for or semantics in some way, in addition to the and? I hear your pain, Clemens. I don't have the answer, but just you have typo in the cloud difference in source. Oh my <laughs> gosh, that, that's what you focus on. Okay, I got it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Does that, I don't think it changes my question, but okay. So, no, you. no, so, I'm not at all. There. <laughs> so if you, if, you were, if, you were, if you were doing this, or if we would need this, I would prefer, I would prefer a, um, I would prefer introducing, like, if you really need anything that is not and, um, I, I might prefer a Boolean dialect, which has an or and an and, which into which you can then stuff other filters. That's that's where we let, that's where we effectively landed with AMQP, um, is that we were like, okay, are we going to start introducing operators in this world? Um, or are we simply going to go and create containers that have particular semantics? And what we, we and we landed on this on the model where we said we're going to go, go make these kinds of containers. So you have effectively a filter that has that is an OR filter that um, contains other filters, and that yields true if any of the contained filters yield true. And then there's an ANS filter that yields true when all of the internal filters um, yield true. And then we also made a not filter, of course. Um, and then you can go and put them all into an AND and they will uh, yield the, the right thing. So this would be effectively be, be another level of this. And that is that seems that seemed so simpler to us to evaluate than starting to introduce the notion of operators. Interesting. So it, just to be clear, you, did you have two separate dialects, one for and and or, and then another one for not, or was it all one, or did it, was um, it actually it's three? It's all one. It's all, it's all one. one. We, have a, we, have a, we have a logic, we have logical, I think I call them logical filters, or they're called the Boolean filters, I, I forget. Oh, um, oh, where's my I like, maybe Boolean's better. That's for and. Um, I can tell you in a moment. I just need to go and find the damn spec. That's okay. We can bring out the word later. I guess the so you 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 did that all in one, which is fine. If we yeah. did, if we went down that path, would it make sense to even remove the and semantics from this so that it's not an array anymore? It's not an array anymore. It's just a singleton, or is and ah, we, call, ah, we, call, we we make we made them we made we made it even we made we we even um, made it. Um, different. We call those grouping filters. Grouping? Is that all, we, gr we call them grouping filter expressions to make okay. clear, clear that they group filters and then there's an all, an any, and a not. So that's an and, that's an or, and that's a not. Yep. Interesting. And, and they're just, a, they're effectively just a filter that can contain other filters and then has these evaluation semantics. Now, did you guys have the notion of and sort of implicit, like we have it here with the, by yes. making this an array? So you, you yeah, so, the, so the, uh, um, so the NQP filter is, well, um, yeah, so the NQP only allows one filter for let's say a source. So we needed to have a mechanism that effectively allows you to so so filters and this is this is why this is why this is a um, this this is a neat trick 
we really have one filter to play with. So we said, okay, but we want to have combinations of those. So we made the filter that is actually a list. And then the filter has inherent, has an inherent semantic that is all and any or not. And then you can stuff alter other filters in there. But effectively, we're, what we're saying is one, so in, in MPP terms, one, one, um, uh, one terminus can only have one filter. And that filter is now expanded, the, the functionality of that filter is now expanded by making, making that filter a thing that can have a list of filters. Um, not, okay, I got a little mean? confused there. Well, maybe a little, and it, 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 I, I am, I'm, I'm assured it's on my side, not yours. But okay, so what I'm trying to understand is, it, what, do, do you, did you remove the array or not? Yes. So, well, so we, we started with, there is only one filter, right? And then so you we, made the, we made so a kind of filter. Right. We, we made kinds of filters that can be all or any or not, and then contain other filters. That's how we, that's how we landed there. Right. And so let me, let me echo that back. It sounds like what you're saying is, if we were to match AMQP, we would remove the array from here and it would just be a single mm -hmm. thingy. But yes. in, order, in order to get the multiple, even the and that we have today, you would have to start out with a grouping dialect and under there use an all mm -hmm. and then list out in essence, this thing as well as one of the yeah. choices there. Yeah, if, if you wanted to have multiple, if you only want to have, if you only want to have one filter there, then you just put the filter. Right, okay. So that's one proposal. And actually, let me be clear. And that would be remove the array from filters. Yeah. And the, the, the interesting thing here with the all and the any and the not is that you can obviously also go nest them. Mm -hmm. So you can have any of three alls. Yep. Where you can now, and then you can go and build um, very interestingly um, complicated um, expressions by simply having these kinds of lists uh, nested. Okay. And this also fits with, and, and from a from a semantic perspective, um, interestingly enough, um, that also fits with, um, um, and, and that is an act that is coincidence. Um, because I didn't look at OpenAPI or JSON uh, schema. Um, so, so I know it's not the flow from in that direction, is um, that you have the notion of any and all is also in JSON schema. And from there has also bled into OpenAPI. So okay. if, you, if, you, if you look in JSON schema, um, for how you define um, a type and what's permitted in there, you have a choice of um, one off or all off and any off, um, which basically gives you like duck type options for how the type might look like. So that's that it's kind of similar. So it, it's also they're not choosing and and or on those constructs, but they have these all and any um, and then one option. Mm -hmm. And one is effectively just all with one one inside of it. Okay. All right. So let, let's pause there for a sec. What do other people think about that choice? No comments? I to be clear, <laughs> I have expected opposition. <laughs> They're stunned. <laughs> Could you dare propose something like that? Okay, John likes it. Okay, Lou. Okay, thank you guys for speaking up. Um, okay, I, I, I like if we. I, I do think we need some sign of or mechanism personally, and I think a grouping dialect makes a lot of sense to me. And if we introduce that, I then like the idea of removing the array because I don't like treating and as special, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I like I like. The direction you guys took with all that so this has a lot of appeal to me at least initially 
So I like it as well. And Ryan, did you want to chime in here? Yeah, I'll speak up. I, I think this is something we talked about when we like took a first stab at this last year. Um, yeah, this, was, this always felt weird to me. It just the implicit semantics of the array. So um, I'm, I'm plus one. All right, cool. Thank you for speaking up. Anybody else want to chime in? All right. In that case, not hearing any objection, let's work with that as a decision and see how that looks. So let me just go up here. Whoop. What the heck did I do? Eh, I'll work on adding it to the list up top of what we agreed to later. Okay. So I, whoops, I just make it bold. Okay. So let's go with this. Okay, we'll see how that looks. So that would combine these two into one subscription, which removes that concern I, I had. Um, ba -da -ba -ba -bum. Okay, now just for fun, I decided uh, what would it look like if we actually use this mythical SQL query language? Oh, Manuel asking, do we need one of? <laughs> do we? Okay, so just the question is, and if, if, I, if I remember correctly, Manuel, correct me if I'm wrong here, that one of means exactly one of the nested expressions mm -hmm. matches. Not So if two match, it doesn't work. Sure. Zero match doesn't work. Has to be exactly one. Yeah, that, that, would, that would swing with what JSON schema does. Correct. So what do people think of that? Do we need one of? Uh... I have I have no reason to say yes or no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't either. So Manuel, since you mentioned that, were you just saying that for just completeness or because you actually think it's going to be useful? Yeah, I think Clemens mentioned something that it can be substituted with a combination of something else, but I didn't get it. I'm still thinking hard about this. Um, uh, it's 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 possible that I'm wrong. Um, and and so yeah. One of might be might, one of might be useful um, uh, um, addition. Okay, but it lies in a stream of events or a subscription. Oh, sorry, say that again. Uh, yeah, still, yeah. So still, if I th I think there could be a useful example. So. Okay. Any objection to adding one of? Oh man, John. <laughs> Yeah, yes, let's, yeah, add, exactly. let's add XOR. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, this, is where you, this is exactly where you're breaking into jail. It's like one of those, it's like, eh. One of, one of is, one of is um, I can see how you need this in schema where you are literally, um, especially in something like JSON where, or J, uh, where kind of everything is duct typed and then you really need to go land on exactly one, one type looking at, um, at, at alternatives um, for filtering, uh, not so sure. I know that, so, I, 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 yeah, I, I'm, I'm leaning a little bit more towards, I want to understand the use case better because filtering down to just one, exactly one event type and trying to understand why you'd need that as a filter. But I also, I'm okay with adding it if people think it may be useful and we could always remove it later. But it applies the other to more obvious fields. Right? It's, it's not just again? type, right? It's not just type. So it, it, it applies to different fields of a cloud event. And I could want for a stream of cloud events where either one of the filters I'm applying uh, is true. true. OK. You, you twisted my arm enough that I'll buy into that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally find it a little bit weird because with with JSON schema, you're you're like it matters that you're selecting the schema that applies, but do we care about selecting the filter that applied? It just feels a little weird. Manuel, or anybody else want to comment on that? Uh, just simply, so an example where I filter for type and subject, they're both basic filters nested inside this uh, new grouping um, dialect. And with the one-off, I could select for events that have one subject 
exactly matching what I'm looking for or a type, but not both at the same time. Do you have an example of when you might actually not want both? And well, I couldn't think of one right now. <laughs> so I don't have a concise use case, sorry. Okay, well, I, I, I need to kind of get a sense from the group because um, obviously it's not a clear yes or no from everybody. Um, do we, would we prefer to put it in and see how it goes? Because obviously if it's in, we're gonna be forced to implement it or yeah. would we prefer to wait until we have a more concrete use case to add it in. I, need I think to get adding, is always possible. adding stuff is easier than taking th things out. So I'm, um, I'm leaning towards making a note and then um, and then adding it. Like I'm not opposed to add it. I'm just opposed to adding it without having clear a clear notion of what of, of a of a compelling use case of what we would need, need it for. Okay. Uh, I agree Klaus? to this. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Klaus. Anybody else want to voice an opinion one way or the other? Uh, I'm on that side too. Uh, it adds complexity to add it. So until we have some reason to, we shouldn't. Okay. Manuel, would you be okay with holding off until we get yep. a better sure. sense? Okay. Okay. So hold on. Um, oh, good golly. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. Moving forward then, just for fun, I decided to see what it would look like if we actually use the mythical SQL dialect that we've been talking about. And it seemed fairly straightforward. Obviously this would need to be com.github.issue and com.github.push, but it seemed like it was fairly straightforward to do. Does this look like, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so this, um, sorry to answer your question, does this look like, yes, this look, does look like, right. But I have something. I have something else that I'm that I'm and, and you are typing. So um, I, I would like to try something something out, and that sure. is um, the instead of formulating the filter like like you do now, um, we could and that is um, like the filter object inside of the filter object have the the filter type be the key of an of the object that then describes the um, uh, the details. So instead of, I, I wish I could type on your keyboard. Um, it, what did it was, you you can go to this doc here, here. Here's a oh, link. To oh, wait. oh yeah, okay, great. Ah, oh, yes. We have the Google thing. It's a Google thing. <laughs> uh, hang on, where am I? Uh, well, while Clemens is bringing it up, um, Lou, you're, um, I don't know the answer to that question. We, I think we may still need the SQL dialect just because some people may want to use an SQL processor that they already have in their backend system because that makes it really, really easy for them. So for example, I can imagine somebody saying, you know what, I'm not going to support this grouping dialect that Clemens came up with. I'm going to just use a SQL query because all my events are in a database and I could just slap in this expression to my current SQL engine and it just works. So I, I could imagine we would not want to get rid of it, but I could imagine people choosing one or the other, but that's just me. Anonymous hippo. Um, uh, I, th I think these, the SQL dialect can do, um, can do um, uh, more then then these com these uh, um, then these co uh, combinations um, also because of the proper language because it has things like like and so you can do easier expressions if you follow kind of the and, and I'm, my, my mind is obviously obviously with the jms like message selectors so those are more powerful but um, you can already achieve a lot with these all and any and not and then simple these these basic filters that we have. So I, I think I think we can get a lot, we can we can um, uh, probably start with um, with having those expressions first and then add SQL if we need it. 
Um, I just want to go and just do the thing that I just had in my mind here. Which would then, I'm just, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to make this a little bit more approachable here. All it's always fun watching other people type. Yeah, especially if they're very bad at it. I have not learned it in this entire career. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, where you basically get, where you basically make the filter. So the filter needs to live inside of an object because otherwise the key would not be unique. But um, it can then effectively, once you have the key, um, then you know what's following. So all is always an object and any is always an object and not is um, probably also, uh, sorry, all and any are always arrays and not is also an array, is it? Um, yes, and then um, and then the individual filters would then have objects associated with them, which then have the conditions inside of them. That's that's a more concise way and kind of gets gets rid of the dialect thing, because we're going to have some. Now now we're going to have basic, and if we have basic and SQL and then whatever logic, then that becomes a little like this makes it more compact. Okay, so you're talking about just a, a syntactical thing right now. Yeah, this is just me, yeah, just just thinking aloud and, um, and not necessarily around SQL, but I'm just using it as an example. Um, okay, that that might be that might be stomping onto people's feelings on, uh, on on how JSON ought to be looking like. So I'm I'm just, I just want to I just want to throw that into the group and say. Um, I'm not particular about it, but that would make the JSON more compact. Okay, what do people think about that option? And while you're off mute, did you want to comment on this or is that an old thing? Yeah, no, um, actually I want, so this still requires um, the SQL to be embedded in an object, otherwise you cannot uh, list more than one SQL uh, inside the, the auto way, right? It's, it's not even syntactically correct. It needs to be oh, sorry, an object yes. that then has yeah, a yeah, single yeah, right. parameter. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, ignoring typos. I, th I think I think Clemens' yeah. point is, let's get rid of the, the dialect thingy here and just make this the uh, the field name or property name or the object name, whatever it's called. I mean, it's, it's um, this is just sugar. Yeah. But I have that. I have that. I just want to put that up up there and say, it, this especially this is this then kind of more. I think Jason's schema does doesn't it do that? Do it like that? Well, we can. So let me ask. Let me ask this while we're while we're thinking about this. Uh, so what do people think? Is this stuff in pink or whatever color that is? Is this a direction people would like to consider? I'm not saying definitely go with it, but if we think it's an interesting option after today's phone call and I write up again what we've agreed to, I can list this as a, you know another alternative to this a little more verbose syntax that people can see it in action and, and play with it. Um, I guess, so I guess my question is, does anybody violently object to this as a consideration? Not agreeing to it, just telling it to consider. Because sure. I agree with you, Clemens. I, I, I'm waiting for Scott to show up on the call. I could imagine Scott barfing all over this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jason Schema actually does it like that. I just need to go and find the right, um, I just need to find the reference, hang on. Okay, Any, anybody want to chime in in terms of whether this is an Think something worthy of consideration, or it's just completely insane. So this, if I translated this into human words, it just means that all of the following must be met, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So long as I can speak it in human, well, from just looking at it, I'm happy. <laughs> That's one way to look at it. 
Well, one so like argument that I might have is um, if you wanted to, <laughs> if you wanted to uh, create a JSON schema for the um, descriptor here, would would it be possible if your keys were describing the dialect? Uh, JSON schema itself uses that, so I think uh, as I just as I just just there there we go. So so JSON schema is using that construct, and I and I would think that you can describe JSON schema and JSON schema, which means but don't ask me how I do this. Um, I'm just assuming that you can. So that's that's what I'm that's the inspiration for what I just what I just uh, said. You can do that. Hmm? You can uh, uh, validate JSON schema with JSON schema. Yeah, that's that's what I was assuming. I, I would have that those those uh, those folks now are up to version seven now, oodling on this. So I was I would have expected that they can. And of course, we have the ever popular one of yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's that's where that comes from. Right. I mean we. And then whether we whether we, we use the off or not then is also um, the question. But I think I think that's a that's a very attractive um, model of just combining these things, and we can go and use the same thing for filters. And I think the syntax is also the syntax is also okay. Okay. Anybody else want to chime in on whether we should consider this or not? Otherwise, we're probably going to list it as an alternative and then review it again next week. Okay, thank you, Clemens. I, from a straight syntax perspective, it definitely is more concise, and I like that. Just whether people can actually program to it, because I know a lot of people like tooling and stuff, and I don't know what whether tooling can handle that gracefully. Yeah, that's that's the that's the only that's the only concern is that um, tooling might be a little upset by this. So we would have to go and take a look at what the. Um, um, I mean, the, the easiest the easiest is we have to ex be able to express that in JSON schema, because otherwise we can't formulate our open API for it, and that will basically show how weird that ends up looking. All right. So I I can I can volunteer to go and um, and try to define that. In open API. Uh, yeah, because I have to, I have to, I have to fuss with the open API anyways, because I'm, I'm literally coding to it not right now um, to, for the, for our interop effort. And so therefore, um, I, and, and our, our, our open API spec in the repo is, is outdated. So I have to go and update that. So I would go and, and make a, make an, um, make a version that, that uses that. All right. Cool. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. So let me, let me make it concrete. I'm gonna commit to update the the Open API spec to what we agree here, including that as an alternative notation. Oh, okay, I like that. You'll commit to it. Okay, good. Uh, and update. Oh, you made it in all caps. Well, great. Well, yeah, you, you, you've committed other things in the past and, and I'm still waiting for those, so we'll see. Okay. <laughs> good, good. All right, yeah, yeah. okay, let's go back. Okay, so this is actually a good stopping point. I, I do have more in the doc, but since it's time for a regular phone call, let's go back over to here. And Christoph, I got you, thank you. Um, just roll call before we go back to the other things. Um, uh, let's see, Andreas, no, Andreas dropped. Gail, no. John Laswell, are you there? Yep. All right. Lucas, Frank? Uh, yep, here. All yep. right, Christopher, I got Ginger. Yes, sir. Yep, Jesse. Here. And Lance? Hello. Hello. And the other Lucas? Uh, yeah, I said yes for the other one. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize it was two. <laughs> That's okay. Um, all right, Matt Hunt, are you there? I okay, will. and all right, Scott, you there? Doug, Doug, Doug. Hello, and Timur. Here. All right, did I miss anybody for the roll call? I think I got it ready. All right, <clears throat> up to 23. All right, let's get on with the regular agenda before we go back to the fun. Um, all right, KuCon EU, last chance. Anybody want to volunteer to do it with Remy? 
All right, not hearing, he's gonna go it alone. Cool, thank you, Remy. And we'll talk offline about the material and, and stuff like that to make sure um, everything's covered appropriately. Uh, sure. Timur, were you going to grab the serverless working group session? Um, what do you mean like as part, as part of what we did last time as well? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, because because we're going to, obviously, we get, oh, I need, actually, I'm pretty sure we get two, one for cloud events and one for serverless working group. <clears throat> Assuming we do get two, you and I talked offline about making the serverless workflow take over the serverless working group session. And whether it's just you or me or not, I just want to make sure that you still want to do that, right? Yeah, definitely. If that's a still okay. possibility, that would be really nice. Okay. Okay. Thank so you. we'll talk offline about whether it's just you or both of us or something like that. Okay. All right. Anybody else have anything relative to KuCon that we need to talk about? Or Ginger, can you think of anything that I'm forgetting? Nope, not this time. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Um, this week, we'll be talking interop discovery at the top of the next hour, so 1 o'clock Eastern. I don't think we have a lot to discuss, but just in case people do. Timur, anything you want to mention about workflow to update the group? Uh, not much. We just finished the looping structure stuff that I mentioned last week, and I think we're just looking overall improvements before the next uh, release of the specification. All right. So, cool. Any questions? All right, thank you. Um, moving forward, a couple of PRs. So this one we skipped last week because I thought the person I was chatting with may want to chime back in, but he didn't. So I think this one's ready to go. This basically just talks about, oh, we never did merge this, okay. Um, yeah, this basically talks about, um, hold on a minute. What is this one about? Oh, they, okay, I'm sorry, I was getting confused. This is about dealing with errors. And basically this is just saying um, in the primer that errors are just like any other cloud event. Um, and that's about as far as we go. Um, I'll let you guys read it in case you haven't a chance, give you a second there while I take care of something in the background here. All right, and then down here, it was just a syntactical cleanup more than anything else. Again, this is in the primer, so it's not normative. Any questions or comments, concerns about this text? Oh, I did also add, I think two, two weeks ago, this second paragraph based upon that person's question about the adapters and stuff and how they relate to all this. Okay, any objection to approving? Okay, thank you all. All right, next. Technically, this was open today, and I'll, if we like it, I'll wait until the end of the week to merge it. But um, last time we talked about, I'm sorry, during the last design session, somebody, and it may have been Klaus, I can't remember, noticed that source template was missing in the discovery spec in the pseudo schema section. So this is just an example of, you know, in pseudo schema, what the subscribe looks like, I'm sorry, what the discovery looks like, our discovery service looks like. Um, so I just added it in there. It doesn't actually change anything in the spec, just adding to the pseudo schema. I just reordered these. The URL in the spec itself actually appears after name. So I moved it down. Um, same thing here, URL comes after it in, in terms of the definitions. So I just wanted them to be the same. And then I just removed some tabs here. So really this is the only real change that's not syntactical. I just added this to the pseudo schema. Any objection with that? And if everybody's okay with it, I'll wait until end, end of the week to merge it and I'll let people know they have that much time to review it, but it's just a syntactical thing. Any questions, concerns? All right, cool. So, so wait till the end of the week. All right, cool, thank you. <clears throat> um, hey, Slinky, um, is there anything you want to talk about relative to the ex query expression language? Uh, waiting for feedback. Okay. Did anybody get a chance to review it or have any comments on it? Okay. I'm going to interpret that as not that we're not interested in it, but rather everybody's busy and that we should just defer this until people have a little more time. Is that fair? Does that concur or match up with everybody else's? Yes. Thinking? Okay. 
I have to look at it and where I'm at. So um, I will. Okay. So but please, everybody, when you get a chance to review that. All right. Now, what I wanted to do, oh, I'm sorry. Are there other PRs um, that need addressing? I believe these four down here are still waiting for updates. I did not notice any updates go through. And I can't remember for sure who owns them other than I know for a fact, Clemens at least owns one, Lance owns one, and then Clemens, you have a to-do on one that you don't own, but you promised some, some updates or proposal related to it. I can't remember who else is involved, but I know at least you two are involved. So you're being nagged, so, right? Yes, okay. nag taken. Nag taken, excellent. Okay, anything, uh, be, before I jump into these issues, I just want to see if we can get out of our backlog. Any other PRs or issues people want to bring up? Okay, let's do this. Uh, I don't see Gem on the call. Okay, so somebody noticed that the, there's a problem with the proto spec in particular with the, relative to the vanity go package stuff. I know nothing about this stuff, Netify or the proto buff stuff. Is there somebody who can take an action to actually create a PR to address this? I know a bit about this. Would you be willing to okay? Would you be willing to take the action to do it? Sure. Yeah. Assign me and cool. I, I sorry, I never saw that. My GitHub events are a trash fire. That's fine. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Can you actually do the assigning I'll at the try. top? Let's and then that see. then it shows up a little more prominently for me. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yes. Thanks. Cool. All right. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate that. Um, all right, this one. So this person is complaining, saying, geez, it's annoying that we don't allow uh, dashes. And I think he actually talks about underscores too. Yeah, in our attribute names. And he would, he wants to know if we can extend it. I'll let you guys actually read this. So I know, I, I know, was that Clemens? Yeah. <laughs> so I know, I know when we talked about this ages ago, we came up with a very restrictive list because we looked at a whole bunch of different protocols out there and tried to find a, a, a subset of the characters that would work you know, as, as broadly yeah. as possible. Um, I honestly cannot remember for sure whether dashes and underscores were problematic for particular uh, protocols or not, or whether we just said, eh, let's not even risk it and just not go there. Um, how do people want to respond to this? Do we, do we want to come back and say, sorry, we discussed this, we thought about it again, but nope, we still made the right decision? Or do we want to say, maybe we were too restrictive? Uh, well, I, I'm sure. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I'm saying the former, the one you said. I mean, that's, uh, I, don't see any, I don't see any problem with not supporting Dash. And honestly, the, the V1 SDK, there was a bug. That I that, so. so you're okay keeping it as is? Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm fairly, sure, I, I'm fairly sure that we have um, uh, that we discussed this in issues long and extensive. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure, we did too. Yeah. Let me. I'll, I'll let me go and find. So keep going, and I'll 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 try to dig it up because I'm I'm fairly sure that we that we documented this somewhere, either in issues or in pull requests, why we didn't support that. There was a lengthy debate about this. Um, okay. Me... Okay, while well, Clemens is trying to do that, anybody else want to chime in? Uh, I seem to remember that we didn't want to support it uh, after we made the change in 03 because we didn't want to conflict with the zero one and zero two specs. Mm. What, do mean, what do you mean by conflict? I, I, I don't remember that. Well, because the, the dashes turned into the substructures inside of the extensions. So they're basically yeah. pathing elements. And so I to remember something like this too, yes. Yeah. So then, so when we, 
remove the ability to make extensions that created uh, subdirectories in the JSON structure, we uh, limited the character set to just, you know, be flat extensions. Oh. But maybe it's okay. We could loosen it now because we don't necessarily support the uh, zero one and zero two specs. So you mean because we got rid of bags, dashes are no longer a problem, that, or nesting, I should say. That's yeah. my thinking. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, there is a there is a um, um, so dashes are a problem because um, dashes are not allowed in language mappings. So they cause problems. So they turn into something else. Sometimes the underscore character, which is different. Um, and then they become confusing because then, you know, what are you going to do with the underscore character? Does it stay an underscore character or does it become a dash? And then underscore is not allowed in other constructs. Like I think you can't use an underscore for one of the header types, um, and was that AMQP or, a, or HTTP? Somewhere, the underscore is not allowed. Like it gets, it gets. Ah, th there it is. You can thank John for that. He got the link. Yeah, that's the nesting thing. Yeah. And then we had it there. I found another two bug 265. So I can blame Christoph. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we had so we had a, a bunch of back and forth. There's and then there's a one. There's two eighty seven that that is being linked. Technical motivations for keeping extension attributes minimal. So, Scott, since you mentioned the. The nesting stuff. Um, do you have any preference on which way we go with this? I mean, now that we don't have the nesting, do you think we should consider adding dash back in, or do you still think it's probably safer to keep it out, especially given the other stuff? Well, well, if it can't map to the other protocols, I am a little nervous about it because it's yet another way that it's not actually lossless transporting mm -hmm. stuff between different protocols. Right. Okay. So let's do this. Does anybody on the call believe that we should consider opening this back up? Okay. In that case, um, Clemens, do you want to try to answer this? this person or would you like me to? Um, I think you might have a little more. What? Did you, yeah, say, did you say nicer, that? <laughs> Well, you seem to have a little more background in terms of which protocols it might be problematic for. Uh, yeah, let me, uh, I'm gonna open this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this promptly. Um, okay. Uh, and and I'm going to do some research on uh, where I think think that was a problem. Um, okay, so I'll say you'll respond, but yes, we're I'll, not going I'll, to reopen the issue. The topic at this time. I will close as by design with comment. Yes. All right. Any objection to that decision on this issue? All right. Cool. Thank you all. Now here's another one to have a blast from the past. Um, so this person, what is her name? Francisco, wants to add, wait a minute, am I getting this one mixed up? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so this person initially said, hey, why don't we add a correlation ID basically? 
And I tried to explain that we've been down this path before. We couldn't come up with a single definition that satisfied um, at least a majority of the use cases. Um, uh, and since we couldn't get agreement on what a single definition should be, we decided to punt on it and people can always add extensions for it. However, um, he does specifically call out Microsoft Azure and he does talk about it being, you know, picking out their definition as saying, oh, they're all related to the same Uber operation. And just last night I responded saying, well, that's great, but that's just one definition because other people look at it as potentially a parent-child relationship, not just part, not just related to the same Uber thing. And that's exactly why we decided to punt on this. Um, so I'm inclined to say we should keep this one closed as well, but I'd like to hear what other people think. So Slinky, your hands up. Uh, uh... I, I hope I'm going to say, I'm not going to say something stupid, but uh, correlation ID to me sounds, I mean, um, we have the partition key. Partition key is somehow, I mean, the, the key of a message uh, in systems that have, partic uh, that have partitions and stuff like that are, um, are somehow semantically related to, to, like a, to something like a correlation ID. That's one way of seeing it. So maybe, I don't know, we can just say to this guy, hey, use partition, ID, uh, use partition key. Again, I might, I might have said something stupid. But... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, from my perspective, what you said, I, I can understand that, that thought process, but I could definitely also understand someone looking at that and say, sure, semantically, I, it's kind of similar, but partition key is for something like Kafka. Right, and if I'm not doing well, Kafka, it makes well, no sense, right? Uh, a partition key, uh, uh, a partition key is yeah, is for something like Kafka. Yes, that's true. But uh, from from a semantic point of view, it, it is a correlation of event. Yeah, I, I definitely see that. Even if what it's named partition key, okay. Did you get what I mean? Did we delete the extension that we defined for partition key? I didn't think so. No, no, for no. correlation. Oh, for a correlation. Did we actually define one? Uh, we had one Did originally. We well, not extensions. Partition. No, we don't have one right now. So uh, I'm, I'm sensing a trap. <laughs> oh no, go ahead. What's the trap? The trap is there's a um, the trap that we should not fall into is that the RPC people get a hold of cloud events and um, start doing correlation ID as, oh, this is the response to this request. That's the, that's the trap I'm sensing here. It's a distinct possibility. Yes. And that, that, uh, that, that goes to the argument that I was trying to make, which is, okay, great. You know, Microsoft has this wonderful definition, but it doesn't match at least two others we have come up with that are very popular. Microsoft you know, Azure has done a good job. To what did to what did we do? <laughs> well, look at this, look at this right here. I'm going to blame you, Clemens. Shared. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh that's monitoring. Yeah. Who cares about monitoring? Um, <laughs> um, uh, that is. Correlation ID. So why don't That's we do extension. this? Yeah. So 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 why don't why don't we do this? Why don't we say, look, we're we're not changing our mind at least that, as of right now. However, yeah. if this person feels strongly about it, just like anybody else, he's welcome to open up a PR to create it as an extension. And if for some reason that extension becomes very very popular, then we consider consider adding it. We can consider adding it to the spec. But as of right now we have no desire to try to come up with a single definition we failed in the past yeah anybody okay everybody okay with that and, and let's let me turn it around is there anybody on the call who thinks we should reopen this issue okay since i've been talking with this person i will take the action item then to reply back and
Okay. Sound okay with everybody? All right, cool. Um, in that case, next on the agenda is to go back to our deep dive <clears throat> design session. But first, let me ask, are there any other topics people would like to bring up on the call for the main agenda, the main call? Okay, in that case, let me just do final roll call for the folks who may end up vanishing since we're gonna jump back to the deep dive. The other Doug, are you there? Yes. All right, cool. And Matt, are you there? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. okay, cool. Did I miss anybody else for the roll call? Christian's here. Oh, Christian. Thank you. Anybody you else? You have already heard me, but I'm also here, Klaus. Yeah, I got you somewhere in here, didn't, didn't I? Oh, no, did I forget to write you down? I could have no, I'm, I'm, uh, oh, There you are. It's just not the mark already. There you go. Gotcha. I'm sorry. Okay, did I miss anybody? Yeah, I couldn't find myself on the list. Oh, Manuel, Manuel. you're right. I forgot. You. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Anybody else? All right. In that case, if you do not care about the deep dive design or you don't care about the discovery interop, you are free to go. And thank you all for joining. Otherwise, we're going to switch back to the deep dive design discussion. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. All right. So let's see. Where were we? Do, do, do. That one, that one, that one. Okay, come to you. All right, back to the design. Um, okay, so we already talked about doing an or, so we talked about creating another dialect. Oh, okay, just for those who joined late, um, just to bring you up to speed. One of the things we talked about was whether or was it okay? Whether we wanted to support an or in the filter expression, right? Because right be, before today's call, filters was basically a list of expression thingies or whatever these things are called, and there's an implicit and because it's, it's an array. And we had some discussion, and we decided, well, let's make it a singleton instead of an array. But however, add a grouping dialect so that you can then add in whatever semantics you want, basically an and, or, and a not. And this allows for nesting of these filters as well um, to give you whatever kind of complicated things you wanna do. But that means the bare minimum um, that people might choose to support would just be, if they just support just basic, it's no ands, no ors, just a simple string matching type thing. Okay, so that's how we're gonna get uh, ors into the filter expressions is through this grouping grouping dialect. And then the open question was, is okay, we've got an and, an or, and a not, should we do an exact one kind of thing or a one of thing? And we decided as of right now to not include it, but to revisit it later, if people can come up with a, with a really good use case for why we want it. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to bring forward is as we had that discussion, Clemens, as we got into this SQL example, just because um, I wanted to see what it would look like if we actually use the mythical SQL proposal that uh, Slinky was working on and what it would look like. And it, you know, it's a fairly nice compact thing, pretty cool. However, Clemens said, well, what if we, from a syntax perspective, change it so that instead of being as verbose as we are, what if it looked like this? where the dialect type is actually sort of the name of the object itself or the key instead. And that's following a similar pattern we've been seeing in uh, JSON schema where you can get stuff like this. Okay. For those folks who weren't on the previous part of the call, any questions about that? I think those are the big things that we talked about. All right, moving forward then. Um, Let's see, where were we? Okay, so one of the things I wanted to ask about is um, filters right now are basically defined as uh, conceptually filtering over a stream of events that are coming from the event producer, right? It's that phase two that we talked about where phase one is creating the event, phase two is filtering the events and then phase three is sending. So phase two, as we currently have it sort of as a mental model is strictly filtering over this stream, which means you're, you can only filter on the properties that appear in each event as it's gonna appear on the wire, okay? So I started wondering, 
especially during the previous incantation of this GitHub example of, well, what if I don't want to filter on something that appears in the wire? What if I want to filter on some attribute that's known to the event producer, but is not actually manifested on the wire itself? Should filters be allowed to actually uh, include things that are not in the event itself? Okay. And that's the gist of sort of my question for the group here. Before I state my opinion, I wanted to sort of stop there and see if that makes any sense and see if there are any opinions on that. No one? Okay. My, in my thinking about this, I came to the conclusion that we should keep filtering to be just a filtering mechanism on what's on the wire or in the event itself. Um, if someone wants to support uh, filtering over something that's not on the wire, I would be inclined to say, fine, you can do that, but use the config stuff that we talked about and define your own config property thingy. Even if that config property thingy is a filter, do your own thing. Um, but let's keep filters pretty pure and simple and it, it impacts just what goes on the wire. But that's, that was just my initial thought process. What do people think? Somebody's highlighting like crazy. All right, seeing lots of plus ones in the group. Anybody think that we need to expand filters beyond what's on the wire? Manuel, did you want to speak up? Nope. No, I, I agree we shouldn't. Um, because okay. it's the producing stage, it's maybe that's the problem with the word filtering. It, uh, comes on the subscription on the message stream, so it can only apply to messages. My opinion. All right. Okay. Cool. All right. I just wanted to make sure we thought about that. Um, okay. So this isn't actually trying to get to any kind of decision, other than as I was thinking about this last night, I thought, well, what happens if someone actually doesn't want to specify source or type, and they want to try to specify the entire GitHub uh, subscription that we've been playing with using just filters, okay? And what I decided to do is say, okay, well, what if I choose to write it as, well, here's my normal filter. I want just these two types of events, but instead of specifying the event source, I'm gonna specify it where there's a property called owner and repo. Actually, this isn't gonna work because we just agree we can't filter on things outside the message. If you could specify, if you could filter on things outside the message, this is how I was going to say you someone could do it. But since we just killed the idea, never mind. This isn't worth even discussing anymore. So I apologize. Okay, next topic that I had. Oh, wait a minute, Eric. What are you saying here? Um, no. So source and type are filterable uh, because they appear on the wire. Does that answer your question, Eric? Yeah, that's good. Okay, good. Okay, so this this question I have here was actually driven, I think it may have been Clemens last week, who either asked about it or thought about, the, well, how do you know which event is related to which subscription? And I was wondering whether we should consider adding a formal cloud event extension, meaning it's an extension, not in the spec, called subscription ID. That way people, when they get an event, um, can know which subscription it's related to, so they know exactly which subscription resource they need to, to delete, to, to kill it. Um, and we would, if we did this, I would say that we should make it a, a should for the subscription manager to include it um, in the event sent. I would love to make it a must, but I'm not sure we can. That's why I was thinking of making it a should. But what do people think? I have an opinion about this. So if my subscription manager was acting as a third party subscription facilitator and I have producers not knowing about the subscription handling, uh, it's going to be tough, especially if I have um, multiple subscriptions onto which I want the uh, then producer or broker at the subscription ID, which is a, a feature I wouldn't have with the, remember when we talked about the Firehost thing, adding subscription mm -hmm. IDs to all of the events, I, I don't think that is a good idea. So are you saying, 
So I understand you're saying that there are definitely situations where you don't have access to the subscription ID, therefore, as a piece of middleware, you can't add it. I definitely understand that, which is why I, I agree with you. It, it cannot be a must. Do you think it would be a mistake to add it as a should or even a may or even a recommends so that it's it's clear that it's optional, but it's recommended? What are your feelings on that? This this double in case I have multiple subscriptions that give me the same events, does it double the events? Say, say that again, I'm not sure I understood. So uh, if I receive events on a sync from two separate subscriptions, I this, the same event will be replicated and sent to the same sync with different subscription IDs, correct? Oh, um, I was not assuming someone would duplicate the event. Um, is it possible for a single event to be <clears throat> associated with more than one subscription? Uh, yes, it, like it would be. It's implicitly is it? Okay. more. Because because it think of the the event will be, um, well, it, you would have to annotate annotate the event. That's that's also why it make it makes sense to do it as as a as a um, um, as an extension, because you can imagine that if the subscription is is selecting the event to deliver it, it could go and annotate the event while delivering it. But then if you have cascades of, of subscriptions, the original subscription would, would be lost. So that's interesting. So, so the, I could... the example that I cited in the first in the, in the in the first hour with you know the bulk subscription on the SAP thing and then that running through the 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 event grid on our end to kind of allow um, more differentiated um, uh, subscriptions will be one of those examples where you have effectively cascading subscriptions uh, on top of each other. Interesting. Would would you... And, and just to add that, the the original subscription, the bulk subscription that that Azure makes on the SAP system is nobody's business. Because that's a private relationship between the SAP system and the Azure Gateway, right? And the user, the user is not even supposed to see that 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 happening because that's just magic under the covers. So that last bit is that are you implying then that you would not want to include this on there, or that the the middleware would be responsible for removing it? The middleware would probably want to drop it. Okay. Um, and then, and then it might go and add. In the end, I'm not. So I'm, 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 I'm on the. This is probably not worth it side of the fence, probably, okay. because it's, it's adding complication. Okay. Well, I, was wondering... I, 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 I do appreciate the. Um, oh my God! Please unsubscribe me from this list. Um, attitude that you have on this one. That, yeah, that's what it comes to. Because if I'm getting tons of events from different GitHubs or different event producers, it, sometimes yeah. it may not be easy to necessarily know which subscription actually created that. Because especially if I can create more than one subscription, it's the same repo kind of a thing, right? Um, so to, to the notion of a single event being either related or caused by whatever word you want to use in there, more than one subscription, if this was an array, would that alleviate some of those concerns? So it could be just a list of subscription IDs and it's up to you to figure out which one is actually meaningful? Well, you need, you need more than that because you, need, you also need to have the subscription manager that that subscription ID is valid in. Yeah, that, that, that correlation, I was assuming they, they, they would um, figure out on their own, right? Because when you when do the subscribe, you get back an ID. In the example that I just, that I just gave with the, 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 the SAP, the subscription and then the Azure subscription, um, the end user would not be able to reach the first level of subscription manager and not know about its existence. True. I, I agree with you that there would definitely be cases where the receiver of this may not be able to use this information. But I think there are going to be other cases where the person receiving the, the event does have access to the subscriptions, or at least they were the one that did the subscribe. Mm -hmm. And so they can have access to the correlation. 
So I, I granted, I agree with you, it's not a 100% guarantee. That's why I, at one point I thought about even creating a URL to the subscription object itself, but even that's not necessarily valid because it could be, you know, and a URL that the, the user may not be able to have access to, or the URL that they're using doesn't match the URL that the system thinks is, is people are using, right? Because there's a some DNS magic going on, right? That kind of stuff. That's why I thought this the idea itself by at least can provide usefulness to some people. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I but, think of this so so I I think this is a um, as an optional extension that is an annotation of the event, which means this is always applied by the event, the dispatcher effectively. That, so, so the one that's actioning, that's actioning the subscription, that will go and, and take an event and stamp it with its own identifier when, it go, when the event is being delivered, then that works. OK. So you said something also in there in, in a couple minutes ago, or a couple previous minutes, you said something about how um, making it an extension, and that definitely was my intention. It was not, I was not mm -hmm. planning on adding it to any of our specs. It was just yeah. to be able to think it's useful. But I, before I actually go off and even think about creating an extension spec, is it worth it, right? Um, do people um, think people that they actually think. would make use of it? I'm well, oh, sorry, Ryan, no, your no, hands no. up. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a little bit unclear on what is the concrete purpose of it? So I think we're like talking about a few things. We're talking about being able to unsubscribe, which in that case, I would argue um, the uh, consumer um, should just use the subscription ID of the manager that it used to create the subscription and shouldn't know about sort of the transitive chain of, of um, proxies and managers uh, upstream. But we also talked about being able to disambiguate duplicate events um, uh, and also talked about correlation. Um, so I, I think I, I'm, we should be specific about what exactly this should be used for um, before we define the rules. Okay, well, my, my initial thought process here was for a way for the receiver of the event to know what subscription it's related to. And I, I need to modify that to say which subscriptions it's related to, but I was originally thinking of Singleton because it's possible that I can have more than one subscription for the same event producer, such that I could get multiple events from that, um, from that event producer and not be able to uniquely know exactly which subscription caused this event to be sent to me. And so having the subscription ID allows me to make that correlation to say, I, I don't wanna randomly pick one and get, get it wrong. I wanna know exactly which subscription I need to delete to stop this event from ever coming to me again. Does that help, Ryan? I think so. I need to, I need to think about it. OK. Uh, John, your hands up. Yeah, so I guess uh, I, I had the, sort of the same, the same question about the, the specifics of the use case, but, but also adding the, the perspective of what additional burden are we then putting on each of these subscription managers in terms of um, you know, tracking state uh, about these subscriptions, especially as you were just talking about um, you know, with overlaps and um, you know, aggregate proxy situations where they have a fire hose and they're trying to pass that stuff through as, as cheaply and quickly as possible. Right? Are they like? What's the, what's the, what's the memory and processing burden that they're going to have to add on top to be able to support this? And then we're talking about use cases that it's going to be hard to even support and ambiguity and things like that. So, yeah, I, I want to understand more about specific use cases where we think it's the only way or the best way or somehow more efficient to put that burden on the on those aggregators, those proxies, versus the subscriber having to deal with their own subscriptions. OK, thank you. Uh, Christoph, your hands up. Yeah, I'm also not sure on, on the use case. And I think the whole idea that you just, OK, I don't want this event. I'm just unsubscribing. If you're not so sure what your subscription do in the first place, then you may delete a subscription that actually sends you, I don't know, five or 10 different event types. 
you're not interested in this one particular event, but then you're dropping all of those event types. So I think in all cases, you really need to look at your subscriptions in detail before you can just uh, start dropping things. So maybe the correct operation is not deleting it, but modifying the filter um, to get uh, to filter some things out. Yeah, that's interesting. And I was also reading your comment in the chat where you said it should be easy to figure out based upon the type and the source. And I agree if you, yeah, maybe, if you, yeah. if you subscribe to a very specific thing, I would agree. But if you if you basically said, you know, any source, any type, I'm just going to subscribe to this to this particular subscription manager, then it becomes a little bit more challenging. Um, but I'm not I, I'm hearing enough people questioning it that I'm going to I'll go off and think about it, but as of right now, I'm not going to take any action because I'm not hearing widespread support. And if there's not widespread support for it yet, then it's probably not worth it. So I, I think I got my answer, <laughs> which is simply no, not right now, which is fine. Okay, so we, need to, we don't need to take up more time with that. I'll just let it sit. Um, okay, let me just see here. Okay, in that case, that was the end of the GitHub example. Um, now, Clemens, you and I talked earlier today. Did you get a chance to start thinking about or writing down what a subscribe might look like in, a, in, a, in another example, like AMQP or something like that, or MQTT? Um, I, I, I did not. I, I did not have time to write it down, but I thought about this a bit. Um, and and there is a um, like in the subscriptions document, um, there is a um, section that basically says we don't want to go. We don't want to go and in, and and invent new API for. I think on top. Um, yeah, I came across that today too. Where was that? MQTT. There, here. And more. But this isn't it. You know, there's a, there's a, I have a section on this, on subscription and uh, effectively, effectively describing the, the inherent mechanisms of some of the, um, yeah, so there's exactly, so there's this consumer solicited delivery, the pull style, and then there's the push style, the push style um, delivery. And I think those are different in terms of how we think about those. HTTP doesn't have a mechanism, doesn't, so this might get long, hang on. Um, uh, because I want to say this now in my own words, um, other than just having you read it. Um, so I'm not going to look at it. There is, there is, um, there's one way where you, where you walk up to a subscription manager and say, hey, please give me events. Here's an endpoint. That's what we discussed so far. And, and all the things that you have in your examples are true for all of the different channels, um, HTTP and MQTT and, and Kafka and AMQP, if the delivery is push, meaning if the delivery is initiated by the um, subscription manager or the, the delivery agent of the subscription manager, meaning the delivery manager actively opens up a connection and then starts pushing events through that. That's that's push delivery. The subscription manager initiates the, the, the delivery. Um, that is suitable for all the scenarios where you have serverless, um, we still are here, um, scale to zero scenarios where the resource is dormant. There's only some endpoint which is listening. And then you open up a connection into that endpoint you start pushing events to it, and then the machinery um, on the other side wakes up, loads the re required code, and then this dispatches that event. That's that's why push delivery is um, so attractive for for serverless. It also allows you to go and do you know classic HTTP style um, traffic balancing, load balancing, um, because you can basically just go meter the number of requests that you're getting and then start start up new new resources. So push delivery is great for that. Pull delivery is more what you do in, in classic messaging system where you are effectively hanging on a queue or you're hanging on a Kafka topic and you continuously start pulling events out. For that mechanism, we don't have to go and invent anything. We shouldn't invent anything, but we should really go and just, just say, use the mechanism that's in your MQTT broker, which means if we have a, if we're pushing events into 
um, an MQTT broker, then the gesture to subscribe to those events is exactly that of MQTT, which means you use the MQTT subscribe um, gesture, the, 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 the protocol gesture, and, and, and then on the topic where you subscribed in MQTT, um, the events that you, that you want will come out. And then the question is th there, how do we, how do we um, map some of the constructs that we have here, like our filtering capabilities, et cetera, how do we map those onto MQTT? And they will be constrained naturally by uh, the capabilities of MQTT because you're choosing the, pro the protocol. And so you have um, a constrained set of, of ways, um, one way or the other, what you're choosing of what the broker already gives you. And in AMQP, it's the same thing. You create a you create a node. The node has a distribution policy um, of copy that is equivalent to a topic in, um, in MQTT, and you open a link into it, and then me messages flow out. In Kafka, you create a consumer group. Um, implicitly, you attach to the consumer group, and once you have a consumer group, you get effectively a um, um, a copy of your own stream or your own copy of the stream where you can then make progress on that stream independent from, from other con uh, consumers which made progress. It's not exactly pops up, but is, is, is close to it. So the, the, the notion here of this section is to say, let's not invent new ways to do pops up with protocols that already have pops up built in if you're doing pull style delivery. And that is why this document focuses on how to set up push style delivery and then it's effectively saying, if you're using MQP, if you're using Kafka, if you're using MQTT, well, use the pops up mechanism that's in the protocol. And that is what that does. And that's too, obviously. So this is what, this is how, and, and there I'm effectively just uh, um, describing how that works. So <clears throat> everything you said makes sense to me. I'm just trying to figure out what that means in terms of the spec for these pull style things. Because obviously then there's not a subscribe type operation we're defining per se. No, um, we're, we're just saying, using, hey, go use the native stuff. Yeah, we're using what's there. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because I mean, what we're trying to do right. here is we, we try to facilitate interop, right? And and if you're using MQTT, well, the interop is defined because you're using MQTT, use that protocol. Go read the spec and implement it. Right. So do we need to actually do anything? For example, do we need to say, hey, for MQTT, uh, here's how the concepts of what we've defined, like a filter mechanism or the, the, the config thing, those concepts would map to these things in the MQTT world. Do we need to say that or is it not necessary? Uh, I, I, I specifically made this the sentence above the MQTT says it's non-normative. I'm basically just mentioning those because, because it's, I think it's not up to us to go and um, um, you know, config, define what a, broker, what a broker should look like. And I think it's not up to us and also not in our powers really to go and say Kafka should go in and deal with PubSub in the following way just because the events are cloud events um, or, or MQP or MQTT should do it in this particular way. Where we can go and where we can um, um, influence things is is in this push model, um, because there effectively the, the description manager acts as a client, and there is that's that's where we have our own you know pops up mechanism kind of under our own control, if you will. But here, if we're if we're using an MQTT broker, which is built for that kind of distribution pattern will just have to go and use what's there in the protocol. Okay, Klaus, your hand's uh, up. Oh, sorry, were you done, Clemens? Right, no, okay, no, it's fine. Okay, Klaus, your hands up. Yes, yeah, so in, in general, I, I completely agree to Clemens. Um, we just have some edge case and might be out of scope for the specification here, but um, in some cases, you, you might still wanna have this uh, subscription API based on cloud events because the, the other end uh, is in addition to just, uh, I mean, is, is creating actually some endpoint 
for example, for AMQP, let's say a queue and, and uh, configuring this. So you would then as a result of this uh, subscription API call, uh, get something like a queue configured and then do again the pull style consumption on that. So um, I'm not sure how that fits here. And that I think that would be that would be in the um, um, there would be an option in the push style delivery model. Mm -hmm. So it's it's it. I think that is a that would be one of the protocol options. Um, if we wanted to add this in for MQP, where you say, or for MQTT, where you say, um, deliver into this topic, but then, or, or deliver into this queue, and if the queue doesn't exist, go make it. Wait, Which Clemens, is, I don't know if it's just, wait, Clemens, I don't know if it's just me, but you cut out there for about five seconds. Okay, so so this one might be an option in the, an option first in the MQP protocol settings and in the uh, MQTT protocol settings, where you say, so in MQTT it's actually implicit. Um, where you say, um, uh, you know, if the queue doesn't exist, go and create one. Okay. And then, and then, and but that's that is that is the end of it. That's the end of that special configuration, kind of on the cloud event side, because then you made a dynamic node in the MQP broker, and then you you, you look at the MQP broker from the other side, and from the other side is just MQP. It's same same is true for MQTT, right? So you go and and if you just specify your, MQ, your MQTT endpoint and then you specify a topic path, the topic path comes into being in MQTT, and then you on the other side you just go and start consuming with normal MQTT mechanisms without having to consider anything special as for cloud events. And the only thing is you're getting you're getting messages out of the the MQTT topic that are mapped by the rules of cloud events, but how you obtain them from, from the MQTT, MQTT broker is completely defined within the MQTT spec. It's not something that we, yeah. the question here for, for those for those documents that we're writing here is, do we, is there anything missing in MQTT? Is there anything missing in MQP to get at those messages? And the answer is no. Is up, Manuel, your hands up. Yes, um, I'm not sure if we have a common understanding on this topic because uh, I'm looking at the sample subscribe you put for the Kafka subscription manager and there it says consumer group as a config parameter. And also from what I heard from Klaus, it sounded as if the subscription uh, creates uh, some sort of a queue for uh, the subscriber to consume from. And this is, I think, a misunderstanding because even though it is called the um, pull style uh, protocol model, uh, the, the delivery of um, these brokers is pull style to consumers always because the consumer, of course, it, it connects to the broker and then pulls messages out of it. But uh, as Clemens described it, this is a consumer solicited model in which the consumer provides the broker and then in the subscription advises the subscription manager to create or facilitate this subscription in which producers send to the consumer provided broker. So yes. you wouldn't have a consumer group to consume or to publish to. What the, what the producer does, it publishes to the broker that has been named like the sync that has been Correct. pointed uh, by the subscriber. Yeah, the, you, you are absolutely correct. There, there are two things here. So, so the example that, that is here um, that we're looking at is wrong because we would be only configuring to send to a, so this would be effectively setting up a, a push delivery into a Kafka. That's what we would set up with, it, with an HTTP call. Um, we would not be setting up, it, like if the subscription manager were a Kafka broker, we would not be using that gesture. We would just simply be attaching to the consumer group and 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 use Kafka native mechanisms. So that's right. So that's the first thing. The second thing that we said. So 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 wait. Okay. Wait. 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 Just let you know. First of all, I don't doubt everything I have here is wrong. However, <laughs> keep in mind this was not written with I 
this was written with K native in mind, <clears throat> in the sense that if if I wanted to subscribe to, in essence, a K native, or I want to create a K native event source, which that event source is going to be the one that's going to be pulling from Kafka, but then delivering things to me over HTTP to my event sync. Ah. I need to tell that event source how to pull the events and where to get them from. That's where this information is coming from. And I was trying to figure out okay. how in a K native world this would look. So I think oh, it's a different uh, scenario than what you guys are talking about. Okay, great. So, okay. So, okay. I understand that now that makes, that makes that a little confusing. Um, but I understand that now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're, you're now, you're now throwing in some, um, some, uh, some overlapping concepts because this is what you have in config here is completely a concern of Knative and something that nobody, this is an internal implementation detail. Kind of. All right. In yeah. Knative world today, when I say, hey, I want to get events from Kafka, I set up an event source and I, and I basically give it this information. Yeah. Okay. Right? And, but then I, I ask to tell it where to send it to, and that's what that's here. So this is the exact yeah. equivalent of a Knative event source. I just put it into our syntax. Okay. Okay. So that then then I understand that. Yes. So that was the so so if you were just if if there are if you're using Kafka as your pop up engine, and and what we do with the subscriptions API is we want to we want to facilitate subscription management effectively. Right for in an upper interoperable fashion, and if your subscription engine is an MQP broker or an MQTT broker or Kafka, then well you have a subscription you, you have a you have a pop sub engine right there, and um, if you if you are building this with REST HTTP as we're doing here, then we need to go and effectively add the 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 pop sub engine if you will. Um, to um, um, as a as a thing, and we need to we need to make sure that the that the pop sub engine is interoperable. And that's what we're doing here. So that's the the but, but we don't need to do this for 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 pop sub engines which people already have. That was my um, intent here. In terms of of um, what we just discussed earlier. Um, with you know being able to create a queue on the fly and then deliver into it, um, that's something that is that you do implicitly in MQTT and that you might also do in MQP. Is that um, if you allow dynamic entities, then you can go and deliver into something that doesn't exist, and then the 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 queue or the topic will then come into being. So so yes, the the subscription can cause a queue to appear. That hasn't appeared yet, but the broker obviously needs to exist. So let me ask you something, Clement. Or actually, Manuel, your hand is still up. Is do you still have a question, or is that old? No, um, sorry. Okay, that's fine. <clears throat> so, Clement, let me ask you a question. In terms of the specification itself, it seems to me that when we come to pull style event delivery, right? The fact that we even talk about MQTT and NATS and all this stuff is interesting, but it really has no effect on the spec itself, right? Because I think what you're basically saying is our spec is all about push style delivery because any kind of pull style delivery, well, they already have it defined. We don't need to touch it. Yeah, the reason, the reason that I put that in here is that I know how this goes <laughs> and and people will say, oh, now I have to go and build all this complicated shit around my, my Kafka broker to be compliant with cloud events. So, so I want, I want, I want to make, make it clear that our intent, that the intent of this group is, no, 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 don't do this. Use the Kafka mechanisms, they're fine. And this is, that, that's, that this is effectively in the, in the smack in the middle of the spec, um, a, uh, a clear hint that you don't have to go and construct any of that stuff if you already have a, have a pop sub engine, and if you're fine with using MQTT, MQP, and Kafka protocols. If you want, if if your world is HTTP REST and that's all you do, 
and you're and you're living in an RPC world, well, then you have problems with directionality. Here's a way how you can go and do all those things. So we right. have a, I mean, with with cloud events, we gave people the choice of what five protocols, right? NATS, MQP, MQTT, Kafka, and HTTP, and to, for how to go and map those things. And and four of those have native pops up mechanisms, while HTTP does not. And so what we're doing is effect, effectively we're making the HTTP world, which is the biggest the biggest uh, uh, world of them all. Uh, we're, 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 we're helping that world to kind of come to terms with PubSub. But then at the same time, we're saying, let's not invent top PubSub for the other worlds. That's, that's the motivation for having that here. Because, because I can bet that if we don't include this, if we don't make that clear, that all, all kinds of folks are going to build weird contraptions around these brokers just to be compliant with, with cloud events. And that's what I want to avoid. Okay. So technically, this none of the text about pull needs to be in the spec, but you're doing it as a preemptive strike, and I'm okay with that. Yes, it's, it's a totally, it's just a preemptive strike because I, it's I'm I'm sure that this is gonna this is gonna turn out badly if we don't make it clear that that's not our intent that you go and build all the RPC stuff around those those brokers. Okay, so Christoph, your hands up. I was going to ask if anybody has any different opinion on this. So Christoph, your hands up. Uh, I don't necessarily have an opinion, but I have a question for Clements. So, uh, so for our company, what we sometimes want to do is build integrations um, that are basically event consumers. Um, they're open source, so people should um, install them in their own system, run them, maybe modify them um, to make fit for their uh, use case. And then depending on who the customer is, they usually have their um, thing set up. So they may have Kafka, um, they may use something from the cloud provider, so that they're kind of set up already. So we think cloud events would come in there really well um, to yeah, abstract over those layers um, for us. So, but in, in that case, also part of this is that we know what to subscribe to. So that would always be um, the same. So if we had, so basically what I'm saying, all this, what you, what you label all the shit around Kafka and so on, that's actually what would be useful for this case um, yeah. but what I hear See, you I, saying I is buy, we... I don't buy that argument. You know why? Because you set up a Kafka server to do 10,000, 100,000 events a second. That is very different from uh, being called 100 times a second on an HTTP endpoint. It's just a different story. Like all of, so event flows, it, what, the reason why we're having all those different kinds of infrastructures, why there, there is MQTT and why there is MQP and why there is Kafka and why there is so great competition in this space is because there's tons and tons of different tiny little use cases that cause those protocols to exist and that also cause the, the variety of different products to exist. And the fact and, and being able to go and, 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 and wrap them all with the same protocol, with the same API is something I find um, that is impossible. I mean, there are already those different protocols and having the same management API around them is similarly impossible because the, the, the setup of these brokers are also, is also different, right? An MQTT broker from a topology perspective is totally different from a Kafka, from a Kafka broker. Well, I think what, we, what, I, what I care about, um, and of course, that's just our, our, my, our perspective is that the events look the same that you can go and tap an event hose and the events that are coming out are of the same format. But I don't think we are in a place from an architecture perspective that the event hoses can look the same. Right, yeah. I mean, that's not necessarily what I said. So what, I, what I'm seeing in companies is that they really specify on one thing and then they want everything to consume via that mechanism. So they say, we're a yeah. Kafka shop, you do everything Kafka. And then if that's the best protocol or not, the, in, for this particular yeah. instance, doesn't matter, but it's the thing they just use internally. But maybe it's yeah. a different discussion. Okay. Um, I think and, I those, and, those folks, and those folks show up at, at, at my door every day and I tell them that's stupid. <laughs> <I mean>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you're in a position to say that I'm not, so <laughs> yeah. But, it, but, 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 okay. it, um, but, 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 but for that case, but I mean, 
the, if if a comp, if you have a customer who says, okay, we're doing everything in Kafka, you're okay because you have a common way of how how to express events, and then you only have one API and one mechanism for how you get those events, and that is Kafka. And and with this document as it stands, you'll be okay with cloud events because we say Kafka is a fine way to go and deliver cloud events. You'll be okay. Right, but basically we still have to do for each, uh, for example, for Kafka, we have to say, this is how you subscribe. Um, and then we have to do the same for each other protocol. Yep. But we can't, but, okay, so I, I got it. We can't, we can't, I would love for us to be able to go and fix that here, but we can't even agree on, on yet on common, on common APIs that are polyglot and work across all kinds of, uh, of, of programming languages just for a queue, right? That's, that's, that is already really complicated. And we can't, like, we can't agree on, on those things for, for something like, like Kafka, because for Kafka, the Apache Kafka project equals, equals Confluent, they're running away, they're, they're running ahead with, with whatever the Kafka API is. And then there is, you know, Pulsar, and there's Azure Event Hubs, and there's Kinesis, and they all look different. And having a common API across all of them is something that the Spring people try with Spring, with, with Spring Cloud Stream, where you already have a bunch of works and differences across them, but then that's only for Java. And, and there's no such effort for C-sharp. There's some of that which mimics what's happening in Spring and Go. Um, there's very little to nothing in JavaScript. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's a problem that I would like to solve at some point down the road somehow, but we're just not at that place. Okay, uh, thanks for your thoughts. I think <laughs> we so can I, discuss I just, it forever, but thanks. Yeah, no, so I just realized that technically we're 10 minutes over for the discovery interrupt call. So let's just quickly, do, does anybody have any topics they wanna bring up for the discovery interrupt? I suspect everybody is either busy or Clemens, you're still coding away, but is there anything people wanna bring up? Okay, I just don't wanna miss out on that. If someone joined the call just specifically for that. So then circling back, um, you guys can ignore this. This is just my own ramblings and I just, I actually more wanna get like Scott's point of view on this more than anything else. Um, that was it in terms of what I wanted to walk through in terms of a concrete example to, to try to force us to have just some discussions and come up with some design points. And I think we came up with a whole bunch of things that I guess I, I have the action that I had to go create some PRs for these things to try to get them in the spec. Are there other scenarios that people would like to walk through either today or next week um, that would warrant us needing another three hour phone call or starting next week, should we go back to our normal one hour phone call? I'm not hearing anything. I'm going to take silence as let's process this through our normal process and and kill the three-hour phone calls until they're needed again. Am I hearing that right? Uh, yes. You sound hesitant. Do you have something in mind you think we need to deep dive on? No, uh, we, we can, not next week. <laughs> okay, I mean, obviously we can resurrect it as necessary. Okay. So as of right now, any objection then to canceling the three hour phone call for next week and going back to our regular one hour one? Okay. Um, and like I said, I'll take the action item to write up the PRs or issues or whatever around these things um, and, and see how we, how we like it once it's actually in PR form. Um, are there any other topics people want to discuss at all? Otherwise we can end early today. Christoph, I assume your hand is old, right? Sorry, yes. Yeah. Manuel, did you want to say something? Yeah, you don't want to ruin your day by extending this, but um, so it, when you raised, uh, it, I, don't, I don't know, is it okay to have uh, another half an hour or three quarters design discussion up to the top of the hour as planned? Or sure, yeah, of course. That's, that's why we're here. Somewhere yeah, else? Please. Okay. No, no, no. Um, no, no. 
I think you raised a very interesting point with the example you gave with the K native um, subscription. So um, until now, I was under the impression that configuration is really only about the subscription towards the consumer. So that always the subscription, because if I look at an event or, or let's say a service in the discovery and I get the subscription URL to which I point my subscription, I only tell it how I want the events to be delivered. If it supports HTTP, I can have this push style um, delivery to my consumers. And if it's uh, Kafka, uh, then I know it can produce into my Kafka cluster, but um, the configuration you gave here telling the subscription manager how to obtain the events from another source, that was a bit baffling to me. So uh, that's what it was intended, right? I, I overlooked that the protocol selection was HTTP and then you gave a, a Kafka configuration. Um, so this would, uh, it, to me sounds like a very generic subscription manager. I could more like a, an adapter really where I tell, okay, do subscribe to there and uh, deliver everything via HTTP or the other way around. Um, is that even a real case? Is this part of the subscriptions API? Something um, like this? I, so I, I think the way you described it is the way I had it in my mind, because to me, that's exactly what Knative does, right? These little event sources that you can create in Knative, to me, they're like adapters, right? It's saying, hey, go manage this event producer for me, or talking to this event producer for me. And in this particular case, the event producer, or not the event producer, but the thing where I'm going to get the events from is a Kafka queue, right? And so this is, this is how I want the Knative infrastructure to talk to Kafka for me. But once it gets those events, it's going to send it to me over HTTP. So yes, it is like an adapter. Um, it, and whether it makes sense or not to set up this adapter via a subscription thing, I don't know. I just thought it'd be interesting to see what it would look like if you tried to model it that way. Um, and if we're going to model it that way, I couldn't think of any other way to specify this three bits of information. So that, that's how I ended so up where a, I did. So in a classical sense, it would be a subscription to a Kafka um, or a, a sorry, a subscription to a subscription manager that can produce uh, events through a Kafka and um, channel. And then you, I would point it to um, my little events or oh, my key native um does it come with the broker that's the question i mean it's, it's can native is really it can only consume and then give the events uh deliver the events as an http push but it's not operating the kafka cluster isn't that right True. Uh, unless the the channels i mean i'm talking about the source specifically yeah, yeah, ignoring channels. No, I agree with you. Knative is not managing the Kafka. It's, it's not setting up a Kafka cluster and like that. It's simply consuming events from a Kafka cluster through a pull model. Yes. And this is configuring that pull mechanism. That's all it's doing. Mm -hmm. So then my question to Clemens would be, uh, since we have the consumer solicited uh, pull style and the push style, is there a certain thing where um, there is a Pull style that is not consumer solicited. Uh, I no, there is not because those it's meant to be a syn synonym. It's yeah. we had the, the reason the reason why this why this a little bit um, um, uh, high nose <laughs> term co consumer solicited exists is because we are already had disputes about the terms pull style and push style. And so therefore I, I use that as a clarification term that someone is initiated in order initiating the delivery and um, uh, to make clear what, what pull and push means. So yes, it's, it's, it's customer, uh, consumer solicited is pull and that is meant to be the same thing. Okay, is my understanding then correct that the broker 
uh, address is still something um, identified by the sink and it's something that is provided by the consumer. Yes. So, so yeah. this is why this is why I was this is why I was um, uh, telling Doug this might be confusing because you are being confused by it. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the the Kafka the Kafka thing the Kafka thing here in this in this very example. You should ignore this because it has nothing to do with Kafka. It is simply about how the implementation of this particular subscription manager turns around on its backside and goes and grabs events from Kafka that it will then go and push deliver to this HTTP endpoint. From a cloud events perspective, the config that, that, that you see here has no function whatsoever. This is purely just to inform some internal implementation of how to go and get, get some events. This could just as well be an OPC UA configuration. Yeah, I, I still doubt this falls under, under the subscription API. Yeah, so to me, this case doesn't fall under, under the subscriptions yeah. API entirely. I, I agree. Sorry, I, agree. I think my internet connection is going bad. Can can oh. you repeat that? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think this case uh, is is not for the subscriptions API. Well, let's put it this way. I I would agree with you that this is probably not a driving use case to define our specification. <laughs> okay. Um, However, I think this is a valid use of our specification if someone chose to do it that way. Because right? um, there's nothing in here that's illegal, according to the spec. Yeah, so when you're uh, coming from right? discovery, so, there so, would be... So today in Knative, I'm sorry, say it again? So from this coming from discovery, I'd have the config that tells me servers, topics, and consumer group are three valid fields. And it tells me the type of these fields. And then, but what is written in there, this is entirely up to this specific um, subscription manager. Correct. So it is valid in a sense. Yeah, every but, yeah. Yes, but that's my point. It, it, the it, the it parameters are just is, guesswork. Yeah. Well, I would, mm, guesswork is a little too strong. I agree with you. It's it 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 it, it is specific to this subscription manager. The definition of the config section, though, is up to the subscription manager, right? Because even in doo -doo -doo -doo, even in our GitHub case, well, we don't have any config anymore, right? But let's say there was a config even in GitHub, right? In order to understand that, you have to understand the discovery entry for GitHub to know what those config values mean, right? Because the discovery endpoint, let me see if I can find it here. The discovery endpoint gives you the name and it gives you the type, right? But that's it. To understand what that actually means, you have to go manually go look at the specification for that field to understand, oh, the word org means GitHub organization, right? So it's not something you can programmatically fill in, right? Unless this, unless you happen to know in advance, oh, the URL points to this thing and, and therefore I know what it means, right? But if it's a brand new URL, yeah, as a person, you're gonna have to go read it and go understand what it means to use this particular this particular name inside config, and so, whoop, and so this is the exact same example, right? In order for the user to understand how to fill in servers, they have to go check the specification for this subscription manager to know how to fill that in, and to know oh, servers in this case means what are the Kafka servers. Does that make any sense at all? Agreed. I, I guess that's my background, uh, trying to uh, discover services and subscription URLs that I could pull or <laughs> get events from uh, in an automated fashion. But subscription config um, is, is just, as you said, it is specific 
per service and it requires developer work um, to actually consume um, these events. Correct, yes. And I think, I think that's always been the intention because every subscription manager may have their own unique fields that you can fill in either optionally or maybe some of them are even required, right? Uh, that's up to the subscription manager to decide. That's why I, I understand when you look at this, you may say, oh my gosh, this is just a weird example, but I do think it's perfectly legal. Yeah, agree, okay. yeah. Okay, all right. Was there other things you wanted to mention since you said you um, wanted to take up 45 minutes? <laughs> no, not the entire time, hopefully. <laughs> um, but there is something, and if I may just temporarily, I paste it under uh, Clemens's edition a little bit on the top. Oh, now it comes with VS Code coloring. Sorry for that. Oh. This, this thing ah. right here? Yeah, not even shows the syntax highlighting I'm seeing. But okay. Um, so I had a look at this flattening of the dialect. And when you compare the first two in all, um, it, it, to me, it doesn't really add a lot So I, uh, of clarity to um, the specification because we're adding an, a nested object where we had just two parameters um, in parallel. And then my question uh, following that um, optimization. I, I agree it reads nicely. So we, you can read SQL condition type equals and so on. Um, if we wanted to do the same for the basic filter, uh, we currently we're doing this with dialect basic as I pointed out here. And then to flatten this, we could say basic and then still have our three properties there, type property and value. Or we could uh, go one step further and then flatten the basic um, types, in which case we would end up with, please go down a bit. If we said, okay, basic is just an indirection of specifying one of the three uh, matching types, exact prefix and suffix, we could flatten it even further and say, um, take the property that we wanna compare uh, as the parameter name. So here type and put the value in the value section of that. So we can have an exact matching on type com github issue or a prefix equivalent with com github and the suffix equivalent. So it was just an idea if we do a little bit of simplification and um, flatten this dialect into a property name, but add the complexity of having a nested object to me, this doesn't give much back to the spec, but if we went one step further with the exact prefix and suffix, this would make it, um, yeah, it, more syntax, uh, less text. What do people think about this? I mean, to me, if you, to me, if you buy into this whole notion of putting all here, this is a natural next step, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, so, that, yeah, that is true. Well, if we if we can find how um, if we can find a, a great way to, to escape effectively other dialects, then that's great. Because we're effectively. So, so, so exact becomes its, so exact and prefix and suffix become their own dialects. Yep. Um, that's actually not terrible. That's, that's, we, we have an exact filter, a prefix filter, a suffix filter, and a SQL, a SQL filter. So effectively, we're now, um, which, which mirrors effectively the NPP model, where you don't have, you don't deal in dialects, but you're dealing individual filters. And then you can just go and compose the filters. I'm, I'm fine with that. That's interesting. I just wanted to bring it up. Um, and yeah, uh, to be considered, that's all. Yeah, no. It's not a bad idea, it's good. 
Yeah, so, so I'll tell you what, um, since I took the action on it, sort of write up what, what the old versus new format would look like, I'll, I'll go, you know, to the, to the extreme that you're showing here and, and see what people think. It's a very interesting way to go. I like it. Okay, that's cool. Anything else people want to bring up or Manuel? Do you have anything else? I have no, a that's question. It. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Um, so do you have any examples in this of subscriptions where you're not expressing uh, configuration over a single hop? And, and to be a little more explicit about what I mean, we've been talking for a long time about this potential uh, multi-middleware um, delivery scenario and uh, being able to have, you know, multiple protocols switched in and out. Um, and, and when I'm looking at the config sections that you've been declaring, um, they seem to be pretty much implying exactly what a, a single and um, uniform path uh, that the subscription um, is delivered through. And I, and it's, it's probably, poorly stated, but bear with me for a second. Um, if if the, the reality is far more complicated behind the scenes, but I want to um, receive some set of events through some unknown, complicated, perhaps inconsistent, i.e. sometimes some events come through one set of technologies while another of the events come through another set of technology. I don't know. I'm, I'm, being kind of hand wavy, but uh, I think these are the harder cases. Um, something that as a user, I want to be able to specify uh, is something like, I would like the uh, uh, an order guarantee over the events that um, the order they were, uh, that they are recorded in the upstream sources is the order that I will see them as a downstream consumer. Um, anyway, uh, so the, the question is, do we have, do you have any examples where you're looking at scenarios like this? Because I think they may be isn't destructive for bringing up some uh, important and uh, you know, ongoing design decisions. So in that particular case for like the guaranteed order delivery, what's not clear to me is whether that would be a config thing versus a protocol setting thing. Does anybody else have an opinion on that? Because I think that would have to be part of the answer you're looking for, wouldn't it? I'm still holding all of exactly where things are a little loosely. Um, it, it still seems to me that a lot of what you're declaring in config is, is really a filter and the, uh, the source and types are in themselves filters, but it, anyway. The, the, the kind of considerations and concerns that are being properly expressed uh, in uh, that, are, that are really the real uh, kind of expressing the real needs of the uh, subscriber. I, I think that making sure that those are present, present and accounted for uh, is is of a higher priority than how we factor it all in there. I'm not quite sure I answer you. Because so, so let me let me let me try to say what was right in my head. So a, a while ago, a couple weeks ago, when I was basically starting to write up this document, my mind jumped to I think where you're what you're kind of poking on, which is this idea of trying to categorize things is, is a little annoying in some ways, right? Um, and, and I kind of then took that, that thought process to an extreme and basically said, well, everything is just a top level thing, right? And you just basically specify a whole bunch of different properties just to tell the, the, the event manager or the subscription manager what you want to have happen. Right? And whether it's a protocol thing versus a filter thing versus a config thing, they don't know, they don't care. 
it just, you know, there's a, there's a property defined that you need to fill in that says, hey, make this semantic happen, right? And trying to categorize things was kind of silly the same way we got rid of buckets entirely in cloud events, right? Because I argued it was silly to try to, to define a foo in one bucket to mean something different, to mean a different thing from a foo in a second bucket, right? Got, that was just gonna be really confusing. So why not move everything to the top level and just pick a better name than foo? That way it's, it's more descriptive. Um, and I kind of wondering whether you're poking on the same thing here, which is, you know, why are we having all these buckets? Is that kind of where you're headed with all this? I, I think this is the, the much less important point. Um, whether, whether source and types are elevated into a top level or part of the filters. I mean, there's, there's fundamentally a specification of what information you want to receive. And that's, and, but there's also a question of how do I, in the very last hop, want to receive it? And I, I think the thing that I'm asking about uh, trying to be more useful because I'm, I'm bringing a lot to the table that's very specific to me and I apologize for that, but um, there's an important consideration of there is a lot that can happen uh, during the original production and then delivery to me in that last hop. And as a consumer of events, I may, I mean, I, personally, I have some very strong opinions about what I want to be guaranteed uh, through that entire delivery chain. Now, you know, my bias here is I'm really kind of obsessive about order. Order is equivalent to consensus and uh, you can achieve it without any consensus algorithm or coordination if you can maintain order throughout the entire system. And where there are, you know, uncorrelated orders, you create a join of, event streams in order to main, uh, to establish causal order between events and and therefore, you know, anyway, uh, this is the sort of stuff I, I spend a lot of brain power thinking about because I really like the notion. It, it ticks my brain. Um, but that means that I have really strong opinions about what I want from uh, a subscription. And particularly that I want it to maintain, give me an order guarantee a guarantee that the order originally observed will be uh, maintained. Um, so, you know, this is why uh, Clemens, I use Event Hub and hate, uh, uh, what is it, the other one, the uh, the one you guys always, Event Grid, you push a lot, or at least the marketing pushes a lot. But um, I, I use that because of this order guarantee and the way that that drives how my systems behave. Um, and, and while I can specify the last hop cloud events allows in, or at least what I'm seeing specified here in the last hop, uh, cloud events allows for the specification of a whole arbitrary or uh, the non-knowledge of a whole arbitrary chain of middlewares deliver, delivering from the production of the event to, to me. And, I, and I'm, I'm not seeing anything that is trying to specify and therefore kind of draw out any of the issues that might come with those sorts of scenarios and the, the user demands for them. So, um, you know, we're, I'm being very indulgent here. Uh, the real thing is, you know, the, the question was, you know, do you have any of those scenarios here? Because I think they'll be instructive for the sorts of things that as we define cloud events and thought about it and talked about it in the past that we should probably bring to bear because they really show up in the subscription and delivery. So I, I think the short answer to the question is no. I, I personally don't have any, I haven't written up any scenarios that talk about that, but I, but I think in general, what you're basically talking about is where, how would you express your, for lack of a better phrase, quality of service requirements? Is that fair? I think that's a reasonable thing. I, I would expect it to go into config personally, but. Okay, but so I guess I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out the end goal of your, of your topic, right? Is it that you think- Maybe this is, the, the question is to say this, 
I think this is a really valuable exercise that these examples have asked, caused us to ask some important concrete questions and bring some of the fine distinctions to bear. And um, I, I was saying kind of yes and, I think this uh, kind of more advanced case might be something that needs to be considered. Okay, yeah, and I think that goes to what I was asking earlier, which is, hey guys, think of other examples that we wanna walk through. And I think the ones that are, that are rattling around in your head are great examples. So if you can write, so it, take, take the, one of the examples that you were just talking about, right? And write that down into a doc and say, this is how you would, you would model it, right? This is what you would expect your subscribe to look like to get the thing that you're just describing, right? you know, guaranteed order delivery, whatever it might be. And let's walk through it and see what falls out of that. Maybe it will be a very short discussion because what you write down is exactly the way everybody else would have done it. And it makes perfect sense. Or we end up in a rat hole discussion like we've had for the last two weeks or three weeks and we need to have to make some design changes to the spec. So I, I would love that exercise. It sounds like I'm not getting out of uh, writing that user, uh, <laughs> user case up. I, I started doing it last uh, week and ate most of my day and had an awkward uh, stand up, but uh, I, I guess I'm doing some again. No, I think somebody else needs to take the pen for a while besides me. <laughs> so, yeah, if, if you, it's but entirely I, fair. yeah, I mean, I, my, my when, when it comes to people like yourself, Clemens, Klaus, you know, you guys, I, I think you guys have far more experience in this space than I do, right? That's why I stuck with GitHub, because that's a very simple example that I personally use on a, on a daily basis. So I'm, I'm looking for you guys to come up with more real world scenario or other real world scenarios, because obviously GitHub is real, yeah. but other more serious, complicated examples to walk through to make sure that this thing's actually going to work. So, so. Klaus and I will have to go and see how much we. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna speak for Klaus here, even though he might just be screaming behind the mute. I, I'll speak up when I have to object. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so so we have a I think we have a pretty complicated scenario, and uh, we will be happy to talk about this um, with as much detail as we can. Obviously, there is um, some. Uh, there will be some stuff behind the curtain, um, which is not maybe not necessarily all pretty. Um, but but in terms of how the cloud events flow works and how we are using the specs to make sure that we can go and coordinate this, we are both pretty well committed to make sure that that all happens in the standard way. Um, I think we're both realistic about having to cut some corners, uh, given that we have to go and ship something by whatever, I think August. Um, but um, we will certainly be able to go and tell you um, some what we're doing with the specs. So for instance, the discovery documents already can tell you. Um, there will be, and that's something we discussed yesterday. I, my assumption is that the, there will be discovery documents um, uh, and when I mean document, it's the get all from the discovery service um, will be created somehow in the SAP system, then we will get it somehow. And then we will go and take that same discovery document and partially rewrite it and, and, and republish it. Um, but I can't tell you what the, what the details of the, those are yet. But, but the, 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 the scenario that we have is we have a, a, a large SaaS system, one of the largest SaaS systems, um, which wants to go and publish events, and we need to go and, and, and turn that into a fire hose of sorts, and then split that fire hose up by dispatching it into, into Azure subscriptions. And, and the mechanics for that are all going to be based on the specs that we're developing here, so we're going to share as much as we can. And ultimately, the, the, the decision of what's secret and what's not, it's really up to, like, there's nobody, there, there are no higher level decision makers who, who put the lid on it. So we're, it's mostly up, up to us. Okay, now sharing, sharing whatever you can sounds good to me. Yeah. Yeah, so Eric, back to your thing, if you, if you can, you know, write up a scenario that we can walk through to make sure it's 
makes sense and satisfies our use cases um, and leads to more discussions about whether the spec is right or wrong, I, th I think that'd be good. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Anything else people want to bring up? All right. In that case, just to reconfirm, we'll cancel the three hour marathon session next week and we'll resurrect or we'll cancel it going forward and we'll resurrect it as needed based upon, you know, whatever design talks people want to bring forward. But at least I got what I wanted out of it, which was deeper to deeper discussion around stuff like this. So thank you all for joining and I'll get it removed from the calendar. All right. Thank you everybody for joining. And we'll talk again next week. All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.